I'm not a musician. I'm not a musician, but my wife is. I'm a roadie. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Good. Okay. Okay, Mr. Marshall, let's see. Amherst Media is with us. You have a quorum of the board. The attendees are popping on in here. I see 633 by my computer. I think you're good to go. Okay. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of June 5th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote, excuse me, <coughs> remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of this public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colvin. I am here. Fred Hartwell. I am here. Jesse Major. I'm here. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Uh, Johanna Newman is absent, at least thus far. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all, especially those of you who are zooming in from a long distance away and in different time zones. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item on the agenda is reserved for public comment regarding items not uh, listed specifically later on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so first item on our agenda is uh, minutes, and the time is 6.36. We have two sets of minutes that were distributed uh, with our packet. 
uh, the first set from April 3rd and the second set from April 10th of this year. First, uh, regarding the April 3rd minutes, does anybody have any comments on the April 3rd minutes? I do not see any hands from anyone on the board. In that case, is there anyone who would like to make a motion to accept the minutes as drafted? Bruce. I propose acceptance of minutes as drafted, April 3rd. Thank you. Jesse? A second. Thank you for seconding. Any further comments or discussion by the board? All right, we'll go right into that. Uh, roll call vote for for the April 3rd minutes. Bruce? I approve. Uh, Fred? I approve. Jesse? Aye. Janet? Aye. Uh, Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That's six in favor and one absence. All right, we'll move right on to the April 10th minutes. Any comments from board members? No comments from board members. Would anyone like to um, move that we approve those minutes? Je Jesse. Sure, I move we approve the April 10th, 10th minutes. As drafted. As drafted. Okay, thank you. And Bruce? I second the motion. All right, thank you all. Anybody want to make any comments before we go through the roll call vote on that? All right. Starting at the opposite end of the of the last names of your of the alphabet, Karen. I approve. And Janet. I. Uh, I'm an I as well. Jesse. I. Fred. I approve. And Bruce. Aye. All right, another vote with six in favor and one absence. All right, the time now is 6.39, at least on my account, on my computer. Uh, we will go into the second item on the agenda, which is public comment. And at this time, I typically read the names of the public that I can see in attendance. So I see Diana Deng, Jeff LeBeau, Karen Lederer, Leila Keo, Mara Keen, Michael Prignano, Sue Kelly, and Sujata or Suhata. Um, I apologize to anybody whose name I mispronounced. All right, uh, members of the public, do any of you want to make a comment regarding items that do not appear later in, in this evening's agenda. All right, Pam, I'm seeing Sue Kelly raise her hand. Sue, welcome. If you'd give us your name and your street address here in Amherst, and then you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Sue Kelly. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. I live at 142 Columbia Drive. And the back of my property abuts or is cat a corner to 51 Hunters Hill Circle. Okay, so we are gonna have that up later on the agenda. So help me understand when that will be. Um, that will probably be the next item on our agenda, in fact, after we finish public comment. Thank you. Okay. All right, are there any other members of the public who would like to make a comment about something not appearing later on the agenda tonight? Not appearing later. Yes, and 51 Hunter Hill Circle will appear later in the agenda. Okay, I am not seeing any hands from any other members of the public. So, um, I guess we will go on without any public comment tonight. Uh, the time now is 641 and we'll go to the third item on the agenda, a site plan review SPR 2024-08. Uh, the applicant is CIL Realty of Massachusetts, Inc. 
The address uh, of the property is 51 Hunters Hill Circle. Request site plan review approval under section 3.336.1 of the zoning bylaw for a philanthropic or charitable medical or residential facility for a change of use and site alterations, including two ADA ramps, rear deck, impervious walkway, approximately 150 feet of vinyl privacy fence and repaved driveway. Uh, parcel 16D-209 in the RN zoning district. Are there any uh, members of the, of the board who have uh, any disclosures that they should make? All right, I'm not seeing any uh, members having any disclosures. So we'll go ahead and welcome the applicant. Pam, if you could bring over, do you know who it is? I, I'm not sure who's attending tonight on behalf of this. So if they could raise their hand, then I can move them over into the panelists. All right, Let's... so Michael Prignano. And Jeff LeBeau. And Diana Deng. They both raised their hand. Mm -hmm. Jeff LeBeau has not raised his hand. Maybe he's right. not presenting. All right. Let's see. I see mm -hmm. Nate Malloy just arrived. So hello, mate, Nate. All right, Michael uh, and Diana, welcome to our meeting this evening. Uh, we'd like you to go ahead and make your presentation on what you're asking of the board. I'm going to let Diana start from CIL Realty. Okay. Um, so from my understanding, uh, so we have a house that we are we have a site plan for and in front of the board is just approval for us to put in ramps, rear deck, walkway and fence and a driveway. I don't think there are more details than that. Um, so well, I, I, I believe we're also being asked to approve a change of use of the building from a private residence. Isn't that right? Um, I think that's on the docket. So, um, um, uh, Diana, since you seem a little not so certain about this, uh, Chris Brestrip, would you mind uh, maybe framing the conversation tonight? Yes, this is a um, an application that's being brought under section 3.336.1 of the zoning bylaw, philanthropic or charitable medical or residential facility. Um, so what CIL Realty is, it's, it's actually Center for Independent Living. Um, and they um, develop and sometimes operate homes for people who um, can't really live by themselves and they might be elderly, disabled, they might be, um, you know, people who just have disabilities and can't live on their own and need to live in a group home. So that's what this is. And um, they are asking for site plan review because of the changes that they're making to the site. And those include um, their adding a little bit of a deck to the front porch um, to make a, a wooden deck under the overhang of the front porch. Um, they're adding a ramp going, if, if somebody could bring up um, a drawing, that would mm -hmm. be helpful. Maybe Pam, could you bring up the same yeah. plan? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So they're adding a ramp to get up to that, um, that deck from the driveway. And that would allow people to enter the front door. Um, there's also going to be a sidewalk uh, that goes around to the, I think it's the west side of the house. Maybe so I should wait so Chris, uh, until the <laughs> drawing shows up, uh, can you clarify for me, is this use an as of right use in that district? Yes, it is. It's by so, so we are not being asked to approve the use of this house as a group home. Not really. You're being asked to, um, well, 
It's it is a a protected use. So I think it would probably be a good idea if you did state that you approve the change of use just in case there's an issue. But really what you're being asked to do is to approve the changes to the site. Okay. So here you can see that there's a driveway coming up from Hunter Hill Circle. Uh, it's an existing driveway that's not in very good condition. Um, and it's got two parking spaces at the end of the driveway. Um, from the driveway, there's a ramp. You can see that going across the front of the building. And that is going to a um, newly created uh, landing that um, will allow people to get. Can you move the arrow to the front of the building? Whoever's controlling oh, the arrow. Me. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Um, so that ramp leads you up to a wooden um platform that's being created on top of a concrete porch that's already there. And um, that will allow people to get into the front door. And the front door is where that little thing that looks like an eye is uh, is shown. And that's actually a light. Um, here or here? That, that's right. Uh, over towards the uh, right, that's a light. And that's where the door is, the front door. And there's also a light um, where Pam had her uh, cursor before, yeah. and that's right over the garage door. Um, and the garage is going to be used as a storage shed. Um, and then there's another walk that goes up the west side of the house, and it's labeled an impervious sidewalk. So we don't know whether that's asphalt or concrete, but it's either one. Uh, and that leads to a ramp that goes up to a new deck that's being built at the back of the house. And the new deck um, will allow access into a new door. And that's, again, where that little thing that looks like an eye is located, but that's really a light. Um, and there's a light on the west side of the house that is right next to where the side, where the walkway will be. So those are the changes that are being proposed by the applicant. Um, the board may also wish to consider whether there need to be some changes made to the driveway to accommodate more than two cars. So unfortunately, we've been kind of busy here in the planning department, and I just sent out a development application report for this project this afternoon. And it does state that um, for this type of use, um, there should be one parking space for each bedroom. Um, now, whether or not the people who live here would actually have cars or not is um, something that you may want to ask about. But the um, requirement of the bylaw says that there should be three parking spaces because there are three bedrooms. So you might want to talk to the applicant about um, how they came to the number of only two parking spaces. Maybe that's something that you want to get into uh, later. But I'd suggest that you all take a quick look at the development application report because there are a couple of things that might need to be uh, talked about. There's also a um, six foot high vinyl, white vinyl fence that's going to go around the northwest corner of the property and it's shown as a dark line. That's it, Pam. Yep, exactly. So it's going to be on the back property line and on the side property line. And I think the idea there is to give some privacy to the people who are going to live here so they can come out on the deck and have a cup of coffee or, you know, um, read the paper or whatever without being uh, exposed to the, the uh, neighboring houses. Um, there's also a lot of vegetation around the site. So the, the two sides of the site and the back of the site have a lot of um, heavy vegetation, trees and shrubs and things. Um, what else can I say? Uh, the interior of the house is going to have three bedrooms. It's also going to have an office space. So maybe we want to look at um, the interior of the site. And I, that might be the next sheet that Pam has in her. Yeah. Um, floor plan, yeah, that's good. That's a good one. So this is showing the exterior of, of the site and what the uh, what the ramps will look like and what the deck at the back door will look like. And there's showing the back door. And now um, as you scroll down, it shows the front door and the ramp up to the front door. Um, so that gives you a good indication of what it's going to look like. And then the next drawing down is a floor plan of the of the 
it's only a one story building, so it's the first floor, but it's the only floor. Um, you can see that there are three bedrooms. Um, I'm not sure why they're labeled the way they are, but there are gonna be two bedrooms on the east side of the prop of the mm -hmm. house. One is labeled bedroom four, and if you scroll down, the other one is labeled mm -hmm. bedroom three. So those two bedrooms exist. Um, and there's a bathroom in between them. And then um, there's living space in the middle, dining, kitchen, and living living room. And then on the west side of the house is going to be new bedroom number two. And if you go uh, down on this page, you'll see that there's a shed that's um, previously a garage. Now it's going to be a shed. Um, go back up. Yep. Okay. And there's going to be an office um, in the northwest corner of the property right there. And it looks like the office might be accessed through, I'm not sure how the office is accessed, but that may be something that you want to ask because I don't see a door leading into it. Um, but that's mm -hmm. kind of what I know about this project. And um, there was a site visit and Janet McGowan and um, Bruce went on the site visit with me, and they may have some things that they want to tell you about the site. Yeah, okay. Thanks for... And Johanna. Thanks for giving us the overview, uh, Chris. Mm -hmm. So before we go to the site visit report, uh, Diana or Michael, do you want to say anything more about to introduce this to us? I can. I'm the contractor from Hillside Builders. So a few things she just noticed. There's a couple of mistakes on this plan. Obviously, there is no bedroom four. There's only three. They forgot to draw in the door that goes into the office from the hallway. Um, otherwise, everything looks good. So I don't know if you have questions about what it's going to look like, the ramps, whatever you guys have about a construction question, just ask me and I'll let you know. All right. Thank you. I assume that was was that Michael that spoke? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Now let's go on to the site visit report. And um, mm -hmm. Janet and Bruce, I gather it was you two. Uh, do either of you want to? Doug, give I us wanted to share. It's Johanna. I'm here joining by phone. Sorry, I was late. Oh, hi, Johanna. Oh, hi, Johanna. Thank you for letting us know that you've arrived. I, I got on at 6:48 for the minutes. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, Bruce or Janet, anything about the site visit? Bruce? Um, yes, we uh, we basically walked around the house. Uh, there was a contractors were there, but they were electricians, so we couldn't really get much out of them. Um, but it's uh, pretty much as Chris uh, described. Uh, the uh, uh, the the site is uh, um, it was a family home I think there's a there's a retaining wall a little further down south uh, that's the, the the what's not evident from the plan is that the uh, there's quite a slope up from the uh, circle the cul-de-sac circle uh, that driveway is a oh I would say eight or ten percent slope up um, there's a terrace semi terracing uh, on the, the on the ground, landscape as it comes down it's hasn't been maintained too well i think it used to be a family but if there were gardens they're not there anymore there's quite a lot of woods around uh the woods are not super well maintained but you know it's it's uh they're they're, they're bush scrub um i i noticed i think chris in the plan you said the fence was on the property line i think it's actually on the setback line and it was a six foot fence and and uh I, uh, I didn't notice that at the time, but uh, one of the things that I would notice is that the uh, that the 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 setback, particularly to the backside, perhaps is rather more thickly wooded, um, and perhaps uh, uh, so that's why it's on the setback line. But my my sense is that if it was a five foot fence, it could be on the property line. I think uh, am I correct? Uh, um, there's a slightly lower fence would be would be able to be on the property line and i wonder why that would be a question momentarily so i'll stop giving 
that's that's all that I uh, observe. Uh, I think uh, that we haven't already discussed. Oh, there was um, some uh, just to explain the deck. The I mean the entry. The the existing porch is about six inches below the doorway. So in fact, putting that porch on is not only widening the deck, but it also serves the purpose of bringing the the uh, entry porch level up to the level of the doorway. There's, there was a door at the far end that went into the garage, but that door is is going away. So um, elevating the porch, uh, the entry uh, veranda or whatever you want to call it in the way they're doing um, is um, a pretty sensible way of providing access to the building accessibly and uh, also um, widening the porch. We, we, we're, we're not sure that it's a ADA or a, a B. AAB compliant, but uh, access, uh, but it's also not clear that the regulatory requirement for that. So we 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 regarded it as a functionally accessible house. The entry door, for example, is not three feet wide, but if you're got a walker or something like that, that it would make all the sense in the world to have the kind of accessibility that they're proposing. All right, thanks, Bruce. Janet, yeah. anything you want to add? Yeah, I think Bruce's um, talking about the entryway reminds me that we were wondering um, who is going to be living in the house. And so, you know, there seems to be access that would enable somebody who had, you know, poor balance or needed a walker or a wheelchair to get to the backyard deck and to get into the front door. Although if you were in a wheelchair, it might be hard to get through the, the front door, which is a little, you know, kind of more standard and then you open the door and there's a closet right there. And so the question was, at least for me, was will people with wheelchairs be there using this property? And will they have access into the building? Like, do you have to widen the door? And if they're in wheelchairs, is the driveway slope too steep? And so mm -hmm. the question is, who's going to be living there? Because that kind of helps you evaluate whether the changes are suitable for that. Um, so you don't have anything else about the site visit to report? Yeah, well, that the front door was narrow and it okay. opens, it's very tight. And then um, there was, so that was one question. Um, and then the driveway itself was um, just kind of a regular driveway. So if you had to park more than two cars or pull in a van and turn around, it wasn't sufficient. Okay. All right. Great. Uh... All right. Why don't we go ahead? Johanna, it's hard for it's hard. I'll just say one other thing. So Bruce was right. We walked around the house, and I'll just note that we kind of looked pretty closely at where the deck would be and where the door to the office would be, and. Yeah, other than kind of the question around the entryway and the driveway, I think it was, oh, there was, there was also kind of a note of the, looking at how closely, like where the fence, how, how far down towards the cul-de-sac the fence goes. We kind of noted where the trees end and where the existing driveway is and how it relates to where that fence line would be. That's it. Okay. All right, so um, I guess we'll move right on into the questions. And uh, Janet brought up a question. Maybe uh, Michael or Diana, you can start with telling us about your program and who is likely to live in the house. Uh, so this is Diana. Uh, I'm at CIL. I'm actually representing, stepping in for my colleague, Melissa McGowan, who is away this week. So in terms of who lives living at the house, that's um that's information that's protected by HIPAA. So I won't be able to share any of their conditions. So I can answer the next question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're not able to, I mean, I would understand not be, being able to identify any specific names of people, but um, can you tell us anything about their demographics or their uh, why they're in the house as opposed to somewhere else? Um, the reason they're in the house is the service provider we're building the house for has had them assigned to them as clients. And that's really the most information that I have. 
Okay. All right, uh, Bruce. Uh, you just muted yourself. How clever of me. I hadn't unmuted before. I mean, uh, for the purposes of our consideration, I'm going to guess that the, uh, uh, I hope, hope, hopefully, helpfully, that the answer to who will live there is who can get in. I, I think that there's a cart and a horse here, and I, I think that we should be, as a board, be satisfied that the House will provide uh, um, support and and to uh, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, people will live there who can get in, and if there's the power wheelchair, there's probably I don't think they're going to widen the door for the power wheelchair. They'll find another place. So my guess is that we don't have to get too concerned about um, uh, access and so forth. What um, I can say, sorry to cut in, what I can say about accessibility is that the house will be built. All the renovations will meet ADA requirements. Um, so you can be confident in that it'll meet the building code for, for that. Well, uh, you mean you're going to widen the front door? Yeah, all the, all the necessary doors that need to be widened will be widened to a minimum of, of 36 inches clear more if necessary mm. depending on discussions with our with our client once the project gets underway oh, okay none of that was evident on the drawings we saw um but uh, a, a couple of uh, questions that i had was uh, i was just curious about those porch columns i mean uh, are you removing the columns uh on the two columns supporting the roof across that porch and there's in there's no indication that they're staying and the widening the porch suggests that maybe you intend not to so you are going to so that would mean some fairly major roof uh, structural work are you really going that uh, you you're putting that much work into it I am we're going to put new post in our space sitting over the new framing okay um the driveway um well, let me ask my fence question. Uh, uh, the reason uh, I'm uh, curious about the location of the fence, uh, you're putting a fence on the uh, setback line, which basically means that uh, are you uh, are you going to be maintaining the landscape on the uh, in the setback around behind the fences there, or, or is that just going to become uh, wild terrain that uh, might affect adversely the neighbors? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you probably saw by all the vegetation that you'd have to take trees down to get it closer to the property line, um, which is basically the reason why it's going where it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the um, the landscapers that will maintain this house will be notified that they have to take care of the whole property, which is going to be behind that fence also. Okay. Um, so that the, will be part of the management plan? Yes. And Chris, I guess we'll need a revised management plan. What does uh, the management plan say now? Yeah. And the uh, one final question, Doug? Yep. Well, not one final, but one more. Um, the, uh, uh, the driveway, as we said, is steep, uh, and it's uh, quite blind down onto uh, Hunter Circle. Uh, Johanna uh, particularly uh, noted that uh, it's probably one of the least heavily trafficked uh, uh, streets in town. So I guess we we can consider that. But it 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 seemed uh, backing downhill, particularly if it was a van who was you know some of these vans. Uh, we we all three of us actually have experience of these uh, sort of residence support re group residences in our immediate neighborhoods, and we we kind of see how. The traffic moves around them from time to time as we walk or drive past. So we, we imagine that there would be might be vans coming in and out, and it seemed that uh, that we should expect to see a turnaround uh, uh, at the head of that driveway, which is one of the reasons I think John is interested in the fence, uh, how far the fence extends, and whether that really has to be, because uh, I would. The question is therefore. Um, would you not expect to have a, a level of traffic, vans, visitation, even if not parking from the residents themselves that would uh, benefit or even necessitate uh, a small turnaround, uh, perhaps where the, the red pickup was parked the day we were there on the western side um, to make it possible for someone to turn at the head of that uh, driveway and then drive straight down rather than backing their vehicle down? Would you not 
uh, think that a turnaround was an important uh, part of the site plan. Yeah, I can look into that before the paver gets anything done there. It was only requested to replace the existing driveway. They never, again, I'm, as a contractor, I'm not telling them what to do. They tell me what to do. So they want to replace the existing driveway as it sits. Mm. But I will take a look at it and see what we could do to at least make it where maybe you'd be able to turn around. And that fence would go about halfway down the driveway. There's a big, a section where there's no trees looking to the left side um, neighbor. So we were gonna bring the fence right down to where the trees start again, so that they would have the neighbors on the left would also have some privacy from looking at 51's driveway. So it's basically halfway down the driveway where the fence starts. Oh, okay. Much further than on, further than the drawing shows. Yeah, I don't think the drawing shows it as far down as it actually goes. So Diana, since you're probably part of the group that's uh, instructing Michael, uh, what would you be open to including a turnaround on the driveway? Um, I'm taking notes. I will bring it back to my colleague, Melissa, when she gets back so that she's aware of the request and then I'll have her, she'll, she'll talk to the team and I can have her get back to you. All right, she can communicate with Chris. And um, I think if we're gonna have that kind of conversation, uh, we should not plan on approving this tonight. Uh, we you know, we wanna just raise some issues for you to think about and then you'll probably need to come back. Okay. So uh, this is Johanna, can I, it's, yeah. it's somewhat related to the turnaround and, and I think this is an okay question to ask, but how many, Vehicles are reasonably expected to be at the house on, you know, during its normal operation. So if every resident has a vehicle and the staff has a vehicle that makes four, you know, that like the current driveway wouldn't accommodate that. So the question of the turnaround was a little bit the backing out, but it was also just, is there actually enough parking on site if there are, you know, because right now there are two spots at best. Right. So it, this property looked like it was near the end of the road. And I guess I'm also I'm kind of wondering whether there's any expectation whether the some vehicles might park on the road. Uh, Diana, can you speak to the number of vehicles expected and where you thought they would park? Um, so um, unfortunately, no, um, I'm, I'm not familiar in depth with the project, but I've, again, I've taken down the question and I will relay it to Melissa and she'll be able to talk to okay. the writer and be able to provide you with a better answer on that. All right, yep. So that's another kind of question from the board. Jeff, uh, Bruce, I, I assume you're finished and we'll go on to uh, Janet. So I guess, you know, so, well, just another question. So the, you know, it's just on top of um, Johanna and Bruce's question, you know, will pe residents drive? And then um, if people are using walkers or wheelchairs, um, you know, maybe going for a walk in the neighborhood, which is quite pleasant. Um, I just wonder what the re ADA requirements with that driveway, because it seemed quite steep. And so I just don't know the answer to that question, but if people are going to be using wheelchairs to go in and out to walk into the neighborhood and you know, or to move into the neighborhood, I'm wondering if that is ADA compliant because it's pretty steep. Um, and so that, you know, basically questions, you know, we're just wondering who's, how many staff people would be there? Are they driving? There is a bus stop nearby, but I think, you know, we should just need to make sure that the driveway and the facility works for everybody there. Um, I have also have, it's not a question for um, CIL, but um, I wondered if, I think I, I I may have missed this, but I the the fire department's transmittal was like, here's all the requirements you need to meet, but no one said, and you've met them. So I wondered if we can get that from the fire department, someone to go out and say, yeah, here are the requirements and they're safe. Because I, I had sort of questions about what if you were on the back porch and you had to get out, is, is that going to work? But I think it would work because of the walkway. But I just wanted someone who is a professional in fire to say that this project meets that. All right, I, I know we've had that question come up on other projects where they just listed the requirements and didn't actually comment on the 
compliance. Um, Chris, is that likely to, you know, do they do they just redo the do the requirements now, and then when the building permit is applied for, that's when they say yes, this meets the requirements. That's often what happens. But if you want um, more information, I I would suggest that the applicant meet with um, the fire department, Chris Bascom of the fire department, and tell them what tell the fire department what you're doing, and ask him for. Um, direct comments about whether the project meets his requirements or not. And if it doesn't, um, or if it does, to send us a message that, yes, it meets the requirements. If it Chris, doesn't. Um, Chris actually sent me all the requirements. Um, so everything Chris sent us, we're doing. It's on my online permit, but he, he you know, he had a list of about 10 different requirements and we're going to do all of them. Okay. All right, that's nice to know. Uh, Bruce, your hand is up. Yes, I, I, I think we should be clear about whether the uh, compliance to ADA and AAB is mandatory, which I don't think it is, or whether uh, the applicant is choosing to do uh, um, a slew of uh, 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 a of things that head in the direction of accessibility because i don't think uh, the building department or us um, i don't think this is a project that unless of course there's some funding uh, obligation that they're under which we wouldn't necessarily know anything about but i i i, I wouldn't want us to uh, be uh, seen to be going down the the road of uh, expecting compliance with the ab if it's not necessary Right. I mean, the other thing that came to mind was it's often uh, required to have an accessible path from a parking space into the building, but to have a park an accessible path out to the street may or may not be required. And since this isn't really a public building, I'm not. I agree with you, Bruce. It's not clear how much is required. <clears throat> um, Janet, your hand is back up. So I think that if people are in wheelchairs or walkers living in this building or may, you know, at some time and they can't, you know, like if there's a fire, they can get out of the building and it's unsafe for them to go down the driveway. So I think, you know, our goal is to make sure this building works for people and it's safe, especially for people who are handicapped. So I, I think I understand your point, Bruce, but I also feel like you know, almost all the projects we look at are accessible. If we know handicapped people, if it's a public building or people are handicapped going to be using it, we do require accessibility and a way to get to the building to the public way. I don't, I can't think of an example where, then the only one I can think of is the Emily Dickinson house, which, you know, um, there was literally no way to do that. But I just, I do think that we should think about the safety and also just that people, if they're living in this home, can get out of the home and go and enjoy the street or, you know, the surroundings and things like that. So I, I don't think it it may not be a legal requirement, but it might be something we think about saying, yeah, people shouldn't be just trapped in a house, you know, with a, and no way of getting to the street. Okay. All right. Uh, Chris, I'm going to assume your hand is a legacy hand. It's actually not. I wanted okay. to say that um, staff will check with Rob Mora to confirm exactly what's required here as far as accessibility. Okay. That's all. Yeah, I, I would I would defer to Rob and the building permit process for determining that. Uh, we can certainly be concerned about it, but in, you know, beyond that, I, I'd leave it to them. Bruce, your hand is back up. Yes, I, I need to take issue with Janet a little more. I, I think <laughs> that uh, I think that the applicant has already told us that they are uh, committed to a fairly high level of accessibility, and I think that should be satisfactory. I think uh, basically the applicants are uh, going to have to make decisions about who they settle in their house and who they don't, and I think uh, that's where the uh, the judgment calls are going to be made. It's not going to be on us to be able to uh, imagine some arbitrary uh, category or class or type or uh, individual who would be living there and and then put some standards of us on it. I think uh, we we must uh, leave that judgment to the management of this house, and they will 
situate people in this place that uh, for whom it's uh, safe and satisfactory. Otherwise, we've got an enormous problem on our hands. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, so before we're done, I would like to go through uh, Chris's development application report and just uh, air the questions that she had uh, and recommended to us. Uh, but before we do that, uh, particularly because we had a woman who wanted to do a public comment earlier about this project, and I see a hand now about this project um, from another person. Uh, why don't we take a couple of public comments now? So uh, Pam, let's start by bringing Leila Keo over. Hi, Leila. All right. Hello, Layla. Uh, would could you give us your name, name, and your street address, uh, presumably in Amherst? And uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Great. Thanks. I want to first thank you, uh, Mr. Marshall, for correctly pronouncing my name. It was like <laughs> I think that's really great. Thanks. Well, I, I get lucky um, now and then. <laughs> uh, so. Um, I live at 45 Hunter Hill Circle, which is a couple of houses down from this property. Um, we are, the neighborhood in the circle is uh, mostly families. There's some students renting. Um, I've lived here for about 13 years with my family and there we have a couple of families with small children here um, under the age of, uh, my son is 11 and there's a 10 year old in the circle. Um, so, um, I guess I'm wondering, I, I did not, under, I don't understand the zoning. So I want to ask about that. Um, I understand that you're not asked here to judge or, or to make an uh, approval about the zoning, but I just don't understand um, because there's no other facility like this in our neighborhood. It's, it's all like individually owned. And this is, this will represent a significant departure from uh, for our neighborhood. And so I just want to understand what, how that happened. Um, and then I just want to ask, I understand that, um, you know, uh, that we can't ask about the people who are living in the facility. Um, but I wondered if we could ask questions of the folks uh, for the Center for Independent Living about how many people would be there and what the turnover might be and what would this mean for traffic in our neighborhood um, with small children in the neighborhood and there's no sidewalks, you know? My son often like rides his bike around that area. Is there gonna be like a lot of traffic or ambulances and things like that, like in this neighborhood now? Will noise, will it affect our noise in the neighborhood? Um, so I just would, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, as you know, will there be new signage if that's the case? Um, can there be sidewalks put in if that's the case? Maybe that would help the people living in the facilities too. Um, so anyway, so those are some of the questions that came up for me as I listened to this discussion, and I'm not sure how much of it can be answered, um, but uh, if, if you can just um, as much as possible, let me know. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks, Layla. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Go ahead and enter your comment, and then we can see if Diana can answer any of that, or whether she just wants to come back, you know, next time with some answers. I just wanted to note that these um, types of homes are scattered throughout Amherst. I think Nate told me one day that there may be as many as ninety of these homes throughout Amherst, and he might be able to confirm that. But they tend to be extremely quiet. They're very, um, you, you hardly notice them. You hardly notice the people who live there. Uh, they certainly don't make a lot of noise. They're just, you know, people who need extra help to live. And, um, you know, they're not, um, well, I won't go any farther than that, but um, they tend to be just very quiet homes. And some of us live near them, these homes, and have not experienced any issues. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, Diana, do you want to comment, uh, respond to any of uh, of the questions from uh, Ms. 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 Keo? I think uh, Chris said it best. Um, 
CIL has hundreds of these homes throughout the state of Massachusetts. They are allowed by right. Um, and, you know, these are just individuals who are looking to live in their communities. They're no different than really any other neighbor that you have. And um, and that's really as much as I have to say on that matter. All right. For a house of this size, uh, how many staff members would be there and what kind of shifts would they be on? Um, um, again, I apologize, but uh, as this is my colleague's project, I'm not familiar with those details as I'm, I'm not working with her client, but I will log the question for her. Okay, thank you. Janet, I, uh, go ahead. So to answer, I think maybe the first question of Ms. Keogh, Keogh is um, state law allows these homes, but, and you can't, no town can say no to them. And um, so they like residential facilities, they're usually very small scale. They sort of mysteriously pop up. So in my neighborhood, the same thing happened and it was also in this house. And we did have questions, the neighbors had questions. Um, you know, who's living there. And there was more information forthcoming. Um, and, you know, in my neighborhood, it's a very quiet facility to the point where I just, you know, wonder, I've only seen people come out a few times and, you know, they might be in the backyard or something. And so, but the state law doesn't let the town say no to these types of residential facilities. And they could be for people with a variety, variety of different conditions. Um, and what we're doing here on the planning board is granting a permit you know, we have to allow the use and just making sure, you know, it kind of works, fix the code and works for them. All right, thanks, Janet. Uh, why don't we go to our next public commenter, uh, Sue Kelly, let's bring her back. And now is the time for your comment or questions. Thank you. Um, uh, as I, uh, my name is Sue Kelly and I live at 142 Columbia Drive. So the back of my property um, is kind of cornered to this home. Um, personally, I'm glad that they're providing another, there's another home provided for people um, maybe with disabilities or who knows what. So that's fine. And my concern is more about a white vinyl privacy fence. Um, and somebody mentioned the wild terrain in the back and that is actually a lovely thing that provides natural privacy between a lot of the um, homes here on our street and i would my concern is that they will cut down all the vegetation and put up this white six foot white privacy fence and um, i would not like to see that uh, because I'd much rather just see vegetation. I could see the house from my house uh, in the winter um, and that's fine, um, but um, yeah. It's okay, fine. so so Diana, I guess uh, there's an expression from a neighbor who'd like you to consider uh, eliminating the fence from your project and just letting the vegetation provide the screening function when it's there. Um, I'm not sure. The full purpose of the fence. It's possible that it's necessary for the individuals who will be moving in for one reason or another. But Mike, who is the contractor on this project, he's here. And I, again, I'll relay this to Melissa. Um, we can see if there's a way to disturb the vegetation as little as possible while still getting in a fence. But um, I'm sure we'd be happy to have that conversation and keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay. I will say on the fencing topic, you might consider a, you know, whether a fence of a different color might be less obtrusive in the landscape. Um, yeah, we might do clay if, you know, it doesn't have to be white. I could do a clay more of a... Yeah, and and, and if, if you are trying to just control access across the back so that nobody wanders off the property, uh, you know, a, a chain link fence that's black or dark gray might be even less obtrusive than a solid fence. So that's just a thought for when you come back. And we won't be removing any vegetation for the fence. That's why we're moving it onto the property so far is so the vegetation could stay. And right. again, now that being said, we have to make sure it's maintained also. Right. Well, it's just the fence will become a pretty visible object for the for right. your putters. 
Um, Nate, your hand was up for a minute. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the fence is tucked, you know, at least 18 feet back from the property line and really close to the back ramp. I mean, it's, you know, if this were a single family home, someone could put a fence up much closer without anything but a building permit. And so the, um, you know, I think that having something 20 feet back to save as much, you know, will preserve the trees along the property line and any vegetation. I'm not sure they could push it back any further. I mean, if you look at the plans, it is, you know, almost touching the back deck. And then on the other side, on the, on the next corner, it's like almost touching the ramp. And so they've really, you know, brought it in at least 18 feet uh, so that there is, you know, still right. a lot of room between the fence and the property line. Right. All right. Um, so maybe that, I don't see any more hands uh, either from the public uh, or the board members at the moment. Um, given our pretty heavy agenda this evening, I'm wondering whether we should just leave it there and uh, continue this hearing to another date uh, when maybe the, uh, CIL can come back with uh, a little more information and maybe some altered plans to reflect the comments this evening. Uh, before we do that, Bruce. No, Doug, I was just going to make that motion, uh, move oh, okay. to continue, oh, move ahead. for continuation. Uh, and okay. we need the date. Yeah, we're going to need a date from Chris. And maybe that date should make sure that uh, Diana's colleague is uh, available, because right. clearly we need her. Um, we do have the date of June 26th, and we have two items on for that night. We have a, um, a new um, public restroom that's going in at Kendrick Park. It's called a Portland Loo. And we also have the open space and recreation plan that's going to be presented and um, reviewed that night. Mm -hmm. So those are the two items for June 26th. Um, we also have, well, there's a meeting scheduled for July 3rd, but I don't think anybody would like to have a meeting on July 3rd. That's just my guess. Yeah, we haven't talked about that yet. Diana, would uh, June 26th be enough time for you to come back? Um, yeah, it looks like Melissa is available on June 26th, so I will, I will let her know. And then if, if after she has a chance to review the questions that are being asked, um, if it's not enough time, then, um, I'll, I'll make sure that she lets you know. Yeah, she can be in contact with Chris. Yep. Do we say a time? What time what, would you like? Time? You said we had a couple of other things. Yes, I'd like the Portland Lou to go first, and that would be at six thirty-five, I think. Mm -hmm. And so this one could we could say six forty-five. I that think so? that's a ten-minute conversation. Sure. Well, so I, I'm sure I'm sure this body can talk about the Portland Lou more than ten minutes. But uh... well, what we usually do is um, we stack them close together. Because if you yeah. don't do that, then sometimes you end up waiting for an hour right. until your next uh, meeting right. is called. So, all right, June 26th, that's 6 45. So moved. All right, so Bruce has moved. I will go ahead and second. I second that motion to continue the hearing. Anybody want to comment on? the motion or on the project anymore before we have our vote. OK, uh, this is a motion to continue the hearing to June 26th at 645. Bruce. I approve. Fred. Yes. Jesse. I approve. Um, Janet. Yes. Johanna. Yes. All right, Karen. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. That's seven in favor. All right. So Diana and Michael, thank you for coming. And we'll hope to see some, some combination of your organizations at our meeting on the 26th. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right, so the time now is 7.31.
And we'll go on to the next item on the agenda. Another public hearing. So in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. It is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. This public hearing is continued from May 1st, 2024. Site Plan Review 2024-09. The applicant is Amherst College Trustees. Property is at 212 Northampton Road. Request Site Plan Review approval under Section 3.339 of the Zoning Bylaw. Other non-academic facility related to the operation of Amherst College. To relocate an existing or existing bleachers and replace them with new game management box including a lift for ADA accessibility, semi-portable bleachers, and site improvements. Parcel at 14C-13 in the RN Zoning District. Any board member disclosures? I do not see any. All right, so the applicant, uh, I assume the applicant is Rachel. Hello, Rachel, and welcome. Uh, at this time, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your project and bring up any graphics you want to show. Sure. Uh, and, um, and then there's someone I see from Activos, and uh, I don't know your name. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Belanger. I'm a Capital Projects Manager at Amherst College. I'm joined by Meg Buzinski of Activitas. Meg is a civil engineer. Um, I'm also joined by Diane Ramsey, head coach of softball, um, available for any questions that might come up about the operations um, of the facility. Um, as you said, the application is for a new game management box and bleachers at the softball field on Northampton Road. Uh, I'll just give brief context and turn things over to Meg. Um, the game management box, sometimes we use the term press box interchangeably. It's a prefabricated structure, 144 square feet um, that will be used only during games. It's for filming, announcing, um, just kind of the, the functions you expect um, going with a college sports game. It will replace a portable piece of equipment that's um, in the exact same location currently. The um, game management box comes with new bleachers that will expand the seating capacity, um, expanding to meet the fans that we already have coming to games and just get them into proper bleachers rather than um, lawn chairs on the side. Uh, most of the um, concrete that's needed for the new game management box is already there. We're just expanding that slightly and then um, pouring a proper foundation with a frost wall that the new structure will sit on top of. It will have a lift. Um, and um, as we discussed in some of the supplemental information, we plan to reuse the current bleachers on site. Um, that's really not integral to the proposal. We plan to add the new bleachers and then thought we might as well um, reuse the existing ones since we already have space for them. Um, and can point out that location if that's um, of interest to you all. So I, with that, um, I'll let Meg share her screen and talk through the plan a bit. And um, we're both happy to answer any questions. Great. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes, yes. indeed. Excellent. OK, well, thank you. I am Meg Bazinski with Activitas, um, as Rachel mentioned, the designer for the project. So just wanted to do a quick view um, for everyone about where we're talking um, about. This is Amherst College's uh, softball field area. Uh, what you see in um, picture one and picture two is the, um, the bleachers and the press box area that's there now currently. Um, this press, the bleacher seat, you know, around um, 60 to 70 people, um, pretty small. And then there is this portable game management area um, sitting behind that. And so we would like to improve this to bring this kind of up to speed with other um, division three colleges, peer colleges, things like that um, for Amherst softball team. So with that, let me go over to our site plan. Um, and everyone can see this okay, switched over. Yep. Okay. So in the existing condition, this is the proposed plan, but um, 
where you can see my cursor is about where the existing bleacher is. And then there's the grass area behind that that portable game management area was. So what we're proposing here is to slightly expand the bleacher um, with more of a, you know, it has kind of the, the main area right behind and then the wings to it. Um, and then put in a, an enclosed press box um, game management area behind it. Um, I'll show you another plan um, just showing stairs and accessibility too. But what you'll see on this plan is we are providing um, a handicap lift um, for people to get up to that press box because it is elevated kind of even with the top of, um, of the bleachers. And so let me go to, this is a plan view of those bleachers. And you can see we have um, areas at the ground level for accessible seating and companion seats. Um, and then we have our press box, this eight by 18 enclosed box with two landing areas on either side. So people can climb the stairs of the press box, or um, sorry, of the bleachers to get up there, or they can access um, from the wheelchair lift to the left-hand side. Um, let me go to, this is just a, a section view um, for comparison. Uh, you know, this concrete pad is what we're adding. Um, this press box or game management structure <clears throat> is an angle frame structure. So there's no actual um, foundations of the box. It sits on a prefabricated um, framed um, foundation that sits on the actual concrete pad. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the existing bleachers pretty much sit on the existing concrete. Um, some other work that we need to do as part of the project is relocate an electrical box. Um, that electrical box sits kind of right where that bleacher is going to go, that wing. So we're relocating that behind the bullpen area. And then there's some work um, to bring power over to, from that new relocated box over to, um, to the lift area. Um, that's really it. As Rachel mentioned, you know, from a seating and then thinking about, you know, some of the site plan questions about parking and things like that, we're not anticipating that the number of people coming to events changes with this, you know, um, additional seating. It's really just like Rachel mentioned. Um, it's just people actually finding seats rather than having their chairs along the sidelines and things like that. So um, with that, happy to open it up to any questions um, that you folks may have. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Who, who did we have that attended the uh, site visit? Chris? I think it ended up just being me. And Chris, um, okay. I Bruce was in the yeah. It, somehow we lost Bruce <laughs> in the process. Okay. Um, but I can give a quick site site visit report if that's helpful. Yes, please. Great. Um, so uh, we went out onto the softball diamond and we looked at the existing structure and took note of where the electrical box is. Um, we looked at how it kind of fits in relation to the bullpen and the batting cages that are there. And with the exception of not quite understanding where on the site the existing bleachers will go, um, we thought the diagrams were pretty straightforward. So that's my report. All right, thank you. All right. Um... Board members, any questions you, you want to ask of Amherst College? Well, I, this might be a first. No questions. OK. Mm -hmm. All right, well, then we'll move on. Oh, Janet, thank you. I just, <laughs> I just have a quick question. I, in the packet, I thought I saw like a view, like if you were the pitcher. Or in the outfield, you could see what this would the what it would look like. Is that no? There's the packet did not include a rendering. It's just a view of the existing structure. Okay, then very quick question: How tall is the um? I mean, like the game management box going to be? Just yeah, I can answer that. So the existing height. Let me just zoom in. Well, actually, I can show you here. So this height from you know ground to top is about eleven and a half feet. Uh -huh. All right. Um, and the new box, let me just pull it over there. This is about 13, sorry, from here to here is about 13 and a half feet. So we grow about two feet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
All right, uh, Karen. Um, you know, I am just wondering. This is this is not something that I'm really requesting, but I'm suggesting that uh, if you can replace the pouring more rug, uh, concrete with these pavers that are put in, which just reduces the amount of impervious material. I, I wonder if Amherst College could look into something like that, not just for this, but for, for all constructions that are going up. You know, you see a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of that here where you just have these, these blocks and the grass can continue to come in and rainwater can continue to drain. This is a small thing so uh, I, I don't want you to change anything here, but my suggestion is that for, with all, all new platforms that one look into an alternative way of positioning them. All right. Do you want me to address, I, for this particular project, we do need the concrete because it's required, it's required by, the, um, by the butcher manufacturer, but um, you know, I'll leave other Amherst projects um, if Rachel wants to comment. I'm sure we can look at those in the future. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Are there any other board board comments? All right, um, Chris. I see that there are a significant number of waivers that were requested. Uh, you've listed them in the development application report. And did, am I right that you did send findings and conditions fairly late in the afternoon? I did, yes. All right. Um, they should be in your email or I can just read them. Yeah, why don't you do that? Because I'm going to have trouble finding it. Yeah, and Pam can probably find them. Um, so the findings, um, I was suggesting that you use your standard finding rather than going through the list of findings. And the standard finding mm -hmm. would be the board finds that the project complies with the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. Is that a reasonable finding? Yeah, I think I'm seeing a couple of heads nodding and nobody objecting. Okay. I'm sorry, are we looking for the development application report or moving on to findings and conditions? Moving on um, to findings and findings conditions. Findings and conditions, yeah. Okay. I didn't really find anything significant in the development application report except to um, agree with the fact that uh, the waivers seemed reasonable. That was right. sort of right. what there I was a, did. a whole long list of those, which I hope we can include in, in our motion on the findings. Yep. Um, and then the conditions, there are very few of them, only four of them, um, <clears throat> that the project shall be built substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whenever you approve them. Um, I didn't make reference to a management plan because Amherst College submitted a management plan the last time they did work here in the field and they're not changing it. Mm -hmm. um, the second condition would be substantial changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans shall be submitted to the mm -hmm. planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the site plan review approval. Number three. This site plan review approval shall expire within two years of the date that it is filed with the town clerk, unless it has been both recorded at the Registry of Deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two year time period. And number four, all work associated with the project shall be completed within 24 months from the date of issuance of the building permit. If more time is needed, the applicant shall come before the planning board at a public meeting for a review and approval of a construction and completion schedule for an extension of time. And uh, wh where do we list the uh, waivers that we have approved? Um, I can list them for you. Well, um, I just mean, uh, do, do they show up in the findings that we find that it complies with the requirements of the bylaw? But Normally, the waivers are just listed both on the application and in the um, development application report, and you state 
that you um, approve the waivers as requested. Okay. I didn't find any reason to not approve these waivers. All right. All right. So um, I, maybe I'm jumping ahead. That the I don't see a lot of hands from board members of of things they want to talk about with these findings and conditions, but. Uh, just to try to sort of rough out a couple of motions. Um, one motion will be that we, the, the finding that you've written, you know, one about the findings that you've, you, that you've drafted here, and um, one about that we approve the waivers that were listed, and then one that we approve the conditions uh, as proposed or as edited by the time we're done with the conversation and one to close the hearing. Does that seem to cover everything, Chris? Mm -hmm. It certainly does, yep. All right, uh, Bruce, you wanna- Do we need four motions for that? We'd have to vote four times. That could take quite a while. I mean, could uh, typically don't we say we approve uh, the application with the following uh, conditions and uh, findings and, and uh, and waivers, and, right. and then and then we tack on the closing the public meeting at the end of it. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, we could we could head in that direction. I don't see that Chris is objecting. I, I do see a hand from Fred, so we'll want to talk a little more before. Oh, we're I, I I have a question as well, though. Okay, uh, it, go it ahead. Had, had to do with the waivers that we're waive. I I support. I will support uh, 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 all of the waivers. And probably the lighting plan as well, but it is a ball field, and sometimes ball fields have lights, uh, you know. And so the question is, I didn't see it on the plan, but I may not have looked closely enough. Uh, is is there any uh, some significant lighting that we should know about beyond uh, uh, something in the press box? Well, I, I see there it says no lighting is proposed as part of this project. Okay, sorry. Yes, there we go. Good. Thank you. That's that. Okay. Um, and I'll just add to that. There's no, there's no existing lighting in terms of like big overhead bright lights you would have. There's no lights that allow you to play a game after dark. That's what I imagined. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. And Bruce, uh, Fred, you've got your hand up. Fred is talking, but he's muted. Oh, yeah, Fred, you need to try again. There you go. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm just, in terms of uh, process here, I think we need to close the public hearing. And I was going to move to do that, and then we can act on all these. OK. I think we have to close the hearing before we. Yeah, we we're, we, uh, we haven't been particularly uh, careful about wh whether we closed it before or after we did the other votes. But if you okay, want to start uh, us off, that's fine. I I suppose I could ask it. for uh, whether there's any public comment on this yes. before we close the hearing. So members of the public, all five of you, um, do any of you want to have a comment on this project? All right, I am not seeing anyone with uh, from the public wanting to raise their hand. Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to respond to Fred um, in in the uh, previous times, um, the boards would close the public hearing and then have a discussion and then vote on conditions and findings. Um, what we've been doing more recently is that we keep the public hearing open and then have all of the discussion. And the reason for that is sometimes we need additional information that only reveals itself when we're talking about findings and conditions. And so if we have the public hearing open, we can seek that additional information and add it. But if we close the public hearing, then we can't take any additional information. So that's why we've changed the practice. So I hope that makes sense. All right. Um, I. I guess uh, that was a satisfactory answer, Fred. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll, I'll withdraw that. Okay. All right, Bruce. I'll I'll move uh, approval of the uh, SPR 
uh, insert the appropriate number with the uh, uh, waivers as requested uh, with the uh, conditions, the four conditions reviewed and the uh, and the single finding um, and that we uh, close the public hearing. All right, thank you. Karen. I second. Thanks, Karen. All right, members, any additional comments before we go into that vote? All right. All right, uh, we'll do a roll call. Bruce? I approve. All right, Fred? Aye. Thank you, Fred. Jesse. Approve. Janet. Aye. Johanna. I was Johanna still with us. Looks like we looks like we um, lost Johanna. Hmm. All right. And Karen. Aye. I'm an aye as well. That's six in favor and one apparent absence. So Rachel and Meg, thank you for coming. Good luck with your project and uh, you can play ball. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks for your time. All right. Good night. All right. The time is 7.53. We have gone through the first four items in our agenda. We customarily take a break around eight o'clock. I think this is a good time to do that. So why don't why doesn't everybody try to be back by eight o'clock? That's seven minutes from now. And turn off your cameras and mute your microphones and, and then turn your cameras on when you come back. Thank you.
All right, Chris, I think we can, or Pam, I think we can bring back the panel. Okie doke. I don't know about you, but I don't know what to do with a seven minute break. That's way too long. I could have used a few more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I chased my cat. That was good. Well, if it were any longer, I would have gone outside and enjoyed the evening. It's getting pretty nice out at my house. And so yeah. I just ran around and opened up windows to yeah, get some the air. air. Feels pretty nice. I yeah. did the same. I also put fans on, oh, bringing some air mm. in. Yep. I ate all my strawberries that I picked. <laughs> I, I have a free I have a strawberry share from simple gifts because I was uh, mm. I I've done enough to be able to pick strawberries whenever I like. Ooh. Mm. Assuming nice. of course I can't do it in November, of course. That hasn't been arranged yet, but <laughs> one lives for that day. All right. Uh let's see. I guess we're still waiting for Fred. <clears throat> Okay, where am I? There's Fred. Who is that? All right, and it looks like Johanna hasn't made her way back to us, so we will proceed. Let's see. All right, so time now is 8.01, and we are now up to the next item on the agenda, University Drive Potential Housing Overlay Zone. And this is a continuation of a comment of some earlier conversations uh, about a potential overlay zoning district to allow more dense housing along that street. Um, Nate, I suspect you're here to guide us in this conversation. Sure. Uh, anything you want to say about the draft that you distri had distributed in our packet? Yeah, I, I can walk through it a bit. I mean, I think, you know, the, you know, staff's perspective is that we're getting to a point where we'd like the planning board to make a, you know, vote this or move this along as a zoning amendment. And so, you know, it's going on a year uh, and then that'll start a formal process. And so, uh, you know, there is comments, you know, writing, um, you know, a written narrative and there's been comments submitted. And so, you know, the idea is to have a discussion and if it needs to continue, it can continue, but to really, Try to move this forward, and so, okay. um, you know, so I think this is a call, nice call, time to call the question. Yeah, I mean, you know, at some point, if someone's you know willing to do that, but um, let me share my screen, and just I guess as the uh, you know generally what we're talking about is hasn't changed in terms of geographic area, so it's everything south of Amity Street outlined in the solid black line north of Route 9, and, you know, one property or two off of University Drive. So the area is owned office park and limited business. Uh, this is proposed to be an overlay zone that really only applies for, you know, three uses. Uh, so it's kind of similar to say like the parking garage overlay we had proposed or 
Um, you know, there's other other overlays. Uh, you know, so the existing zoning, everything else stays in place. Maybe some instances where there's um, you know questions that the building commissioner staff would deal with in in the future. But you know, so what we see here, so office park, limited business, R and D still remains. And so if someone needs wants to utilize those zoning districts, they can. Uh, you know, the general I you know this was written as if it's pretty close to a zoning amendment. The general um, statement and the purpose uh, hasn't changed too much since we last spoke. It did, you know, we did mention uh, in the purpose. Um, you know, housing for undergraduate students uh, and dense housing. And so really, you know, this is some of the, the purpose of it, you know, and, and, you know, from staff's ideas, why, why skirt it and not mention students or dense housing or multifamily housing, because that's really what it is. Uh, we established the, the area of the district. We have uh, dimensional standards that are applicable only to those uses uh, that are mentioned. And there's no waiver provision for what's what's in the buy, in the overlay. And so the idea would be that, you know, someone couldn't ask to waive the height or setbacks. And so everything there is is pretty generous. Um, but you know, we're not someone can come in and ask for an additional five feet. Uh, and there's no additional lot area for family or or you know um, unit. And so that would that that allows kind of that multifamily density. There's a basic minimum lot area of twelve thousand square feet. Uh, a lot frontage of 40, a maximum building coverage of 60, and a lot coverage of 85. And, you know, as we spoke uh, previously, there is a fair number of wetlands and other environmental or site constraints. And so all that has to be taken into account. So even the project that uh, Barry Roberts, the Roberts Group, has proposed, proposed on the corner of Amity and University Drive, although that will be coming um, as a site plan review, it also has to be reviewed by the Conservation Commission and manage um, a number of resource areas and probably proposed mitigation and other strategies to manage stormwater. And so, you know, it's not as if they, you know, we're, we're providing these coverages and someone can just then put concrete down on everything and, and forget about the wetlands or other environmental um, issues. Uh, we have a setbacks that are kind of specific to, you know, different sides of the street or to different, you know, roads. And some of that is to allow for the access drive on the west side to remain and become a multi-use path to allow uh, setbacks on both sides to be generous. So if there's taller buildings, uh, you know, the streetscape is still um, not, you know, it's, it's still a generous, it's actually a really wide right of way. And so it's not going to feel too much, too cramped. Um, we still have a side yard setback and a rear setback, a building height of 60 feet or five floors. The height as in, in our bylaw doesn't include mechanical equipment or screening or solar. Uh, you know, standards and conditions. So we have three uses that are is defined: apartments, social dormitories, which is new, and then mixed-use buildings. So apartments, you know, not allowed within 500 feet of the major intersections. And then the conditions are that there's no limit to the number of dwelling units, um, and that there has to be a proportional mix of bedrooms uh, by bedroom size. And so we're not having a 50% as in the bylaw now. There's actually been a number of instances where a developer. Uh, you know, really has to work because we say no more than 50%. So they might even have two different bedroom types, but given the number of units to get that 50% becomes something where they have to, um, you know, change. And so here it's really at the permit granting authorities uh, determination. So, you know, we're saying there needs to be a proportional mix and it's something that they would have to provide. Social dormitories is a defined an existing category in our bylaw. It's for, um, you know, there's a few different instances when it can be applied. So again, not allowed within 500 feet of an intersection. There's no limit to the number of units. Uh, we're saying that they need to have 24 seven management and response. Uh, this doesn't apply to fraternities or sororities uh, and they have to provide a management plan according to the rules and regulations of the permit granting authority. And so, you know, this is pretty similar to the conditions that are in the current bylaw. And, you know, with the social dormitories that have been permitted, there's, you know, there's one that's been occupied and one that's will be under construction. There's been really no issues in terms of how they're managed. Uh, and then mixed use buildings, you know, we're using the 30%. It's really similar to a definition that we have. Uh, however, mixed use buildings located more than 500 feet from the intersections of Northampton Road uh, and University Drive and Amity Street and University Drive have a 15% 
floor area requirement instead of 30. And so speaking with some developers and others, you know, the 30% is something that because there's no waivers and unless we want to start writing in different calculations, you know, 15% is the minimum, it can be more, but it allows some flexibility for having mixed use buildings on the interior of University Drive, you know, along the core of it, you know, this thought might be that 30% would actually discourage any, any kind of um, mixed use building if they have to, you know, or they would, uh, you know, build a mixed use building and not occupy that 30% and just choose to use apartments. And so we're hoping that this 15% will actually encourage more mixed use buildings. Uh, there's general requirements. So multiple buildings and uses, there can be more than one building uh, with any permanent use located on a single lot. And so that allows for, you know, right now, if, if depending on how the bylaw is worded, if, you know, you might only have one building on one property. So this allows to have multiple buildings on a property. Product open space, uh, we don't have a definition in terms of a percentage before it was 20% of the floor um, area and had some other requirements. And so we made that a bit more flexible. Every product shall provide usable open space. It can be on the interior or exterior of a building, it could be on the site. We're saying that the um, access road would is you know encouraged to be a 10 foot wide multi-use pedestrian path. Uh, you know, project open space shall not be in service areas or driveways or parking areas. This was something similar that had been in the in the overlay. Uh, and then outdoor amenities and the planting of street trees is encouraged. And so, you know, really the the point of this is to help the you know the planning board here to look at each project and say, okay, what what kind of space is there? It can be plaza space, it could be lawn space, it could be on the interior, it could be a lobby, it could be you know both interior exterior, without really being for script um, you know right now i think the planning board still could do this with projects but it doesn't seem like it's it you know it, we do it very well and, and so i think that having some guidance here is helpful uh parking saying that all of article 7 shall apply with exceptions so you know in uh 7.00 through 005 we have a minimum number of parking spaces so if it's a certain amount of retail or commercial, you know, it's so many spaces per square feet. Uh, and then we have a pretty strict um, shared parking uh, section. And so we're saying that none of those apply, uh, but shared or lease parking is encouraged and the permit granting authority shall submit, you know, any management plan uh, with that. And so because there's, and there's not a lot of neighborhoods here, I think every developer is going to figure out what kind of use they have and what how a parking uh, needs they have. Uh, there's public transit. There's the Swift Bikeway. We're trying to have another mixed use path. And so, you know what? If if people don't think they need cars here, and the developer thinks they can have so many units or a commercial space, then that, that's kind of at their discretion. Uh, you know, as we've spoken with a, a one um, developer and attorney, you know, the if you want to bring in a certain commercial retail use that drives the parking. Uh, some want a lot, some want a little. And so, you know, I think having this allows, you know, a developer to really make that case. And so, you know, I think having, you know, two spaces per unit uh, is is kind of antiquated. And really, we're trying to encourage multimodal transportation here. And so hopefully this parking requirements will get us there. Uh, and then there's design guidelines. Uh, again, we had some prescriptive guidelines in terms of setbacks or something every so many feet or a step back of so many feet. We've eliminated a top floor step back. So right now, you know, you can have five stories along the front front um, front setback line. Uh, we encourage that, you know, there's some overhang awnings or some differentiation between the first and second floors and mixed use buildings. Uh, even the front building facade shall have variations in architectural detail, change in plane or other treatment to break down scale and mass. And so, before we said something, if it was a facade over a hundred feet, you know, every so many feet, it should be stepped back so many feet. And that, that honestly seems like something that um, we don't have to have in so detailed, but I think having something like this allows the planning board and the review authority to look at it and say, okay, how, how are you breaking down the mass of a facade? What, how are you treating the um, first floor and upper floors? And so, you know, the new Fieldstone project at UMass uses the same material. They have different direction of it, uh, but they have different um, fenestration patterns. And I think it looks really nice. And so others have commented that they like the Fieldstone project. It's also set back from the street. 
uh, you know, 35 to 40 feet. And so, um, you know, there is a distance there that works, but in terms of how they work with the front facade, uh, you know, it, it looks nice and even the side facades. Um, to the extent possible, we want parking behind buildings or consolidated, you know, rooftop mechanical equipment should be screened. And then, you know, louvers or other mechanical equipment placed away from visible areas. And so, you know, that's the extent of it. Um, again, the idea is to really encourage, you know, apartments, mixed use buildings or social dormitories on this section of University Drive. Uh, you know, the hope would be that maybe there's five or six sites that would be developed using this overlay. I mean, you know, there's existing buildings. And so the thought would be some might be redeveloped, some might be added on to, but, you know, it, if it's not, if there's not enough of a, um, you know, lot coverage or building coverage, then this, this won't even be used. So if we're not incentivizing development here with flexible standards or, or you know, um, uh, you know, reduce parking requirements, then to me, the overlay wouldn't move forward. So, you know, staff sees it as a great opportunity to increase beds and have some commercial and retail development down on University Drive. And, you know, I think at the last meeting, the planning board members all kind of agreed that that was a purpose of this. And, you know, I don't want to shy away from saying, yeah, well, it's okay if there's a social dormitory down here. You know, if there's 300 beds for students in the middle of this, of this corridor. You're, you're talking too much and now. There, and there's other uh, mixed use buildings on the corners and that's okay. And so, you know, if maybe here, if we can actually get, you know, a thousand beds, 1200 beds along University Drive, then we can actually start changing the housing equation in town. And so I, I think, you know, we can have that conversation and maybe we don't think that it should be here, but I think we have to have it somewhere. And so, uh, you know, we can't start talking about, let's not have a duplex conversion if we're not talking about where else can we put a lot of residents who need housing. And so staff thinks that the way this is written, it'd actually be used. I think the previous version that we looked at uh, and talked about a few weeks ago and that was presented say at the end of February would not have actually been used. I think we, I think I said that, but I, I, after speaking with some others, after the planning board meeting, it was confirmed that most developers, it wouldn't get you to what you needed to. So we could have gone through that whole process and adopted it. And I don't think it would ever have been used. Um, and so, you know, this bylaw right here, I think would actually get used. And so that's, you know, that that's something staff would be happy about. All right, thanks, Nate. I, I will say to the rest of the board, I uh, encouraged Nate to put together what he thought was the right approach for this area uh, after our last uh, significant conversation, whether it was what, six weeks ago, maybe. Um, so thank you, Nate and, and Rob Mora for, for putting in this effort. Uh, so I see a couple of hands from board members and I saw one more hand at one point, but it has dropped. So uh, we will start with Jesse. Thanks. Sir. And thanks, Nate. Um, generally, I totally agree. I'd love to see this move forward. Um, I have one concern and one minor comment. And my, my concern is the way it reads, and please correct me if I'm not understanding, there's nothing stopping this from potentially being all apartments or all social dormitories and zero mixed use in, like it could play out that way. Or am I not understanding the way it's written? Yeah, we're saying that within 500 feet of those two, you know, southerly points, those intersections, there can't be, it can only be mixed use buildings. So on the corners. Just on the corners. Okay. Yeah. So, and then, so, so on the interior, right. So, you know, a stretch so of. The interior so could be all just housing. Right. Potentially. And I guess well, that's what, that's, that's what I, my, my one reservation about the way this is put together right now, because I really feel like that's a loss for the town if that were to happen. There are currently commercial things there. Um, I, 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 I would want to encourage more mixed use in that strip because that would be beneficial for the students if that's what we're talking about and for residents. I don't know what the solution is, but the, the way it, when I looked at that, that was my first worry was that as you've expressed, I think that's what developers will probably lean towards is not mixed use if they don't have to. And so well, I, isn't I, wonder... it, I mean, I think you could also argue that if there's actually a critical mass of students down there, then there's then it's likely that there will be 
commercial, that there'll be a reason to put commercial there because there's all these people who could walk right to it. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But, I but agree. We've had this conversation with the buildings in town, right? That they left them vacant for years because it wasn't worth the money to right. get the money in there. So, okay. And that might happen there too. But okay, then in 10 years, maybe the situation changes and there's space available for commercial stuff to then populate. But sure. again, yeah. I'm just expressing my reservation. And again, I don't know what the right solution is. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, yeah I mean, it, so 500 feet from Route 9 would be to the entrance of Big Y. So it's almost to the CVS building. 500 feet south from Amity Street is, um, you know, past the and charter building and halfway into the open space between the next, um, you know, next uh, um, structure. And so it's a, you know, I mean, we could increase that distance if we're worried about it. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it, right. I, I agree with Doug. I, I feel like maybe at first it might seem like that, but I, I would assume that if we get enough critical mass down there, people would take advantage of it with non-residential space, but. And you had a, you had a second comment, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. Just that, so it's just, it's less important. The um, way it's written about the interior uh, multi-use path as suggested i wonder if we can make that a little stronger because i think that would be a really nice feature to keep so that there was a secondary access for pedestrians bikes and whatever um but, but again that could come up in reviews in the future also but it just seems like if we if we really like that as a design element why not make that a little stronger in the in the wording that's all thank you okay thanks jesse uh, Bruce, you're next. Uh, I'm with uh, Jesse pretty substantially, uh, uh, certainly uh, and I, with you, Nat, Nat, too. Thank you. I, I think it's the time has come that we need to move with this. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, as Jesse is uh, uh, supportive uh, with the... Um, but I did read the uh, the 500 foot part, and I thought, well, that's a thousand feet of University Drive, and I thought that uh, it was about uh, half a mile long. Maybe it's more. It's probably maybe it's more than a mile long. So I, maybe we could discuss whether it's 500 or 700 or 800 or a thousand. But I, I, I'm uh, over the conversations we've had uh, in the past few months or plus um, ten months on this. Um, Nate has made the case. Uh, consistently that uh, that um, that the, the commercial we, we need to put some faith into the commercial developers to be able to judge what uh, their needs are and I think if we're going to do that anywhere in town this is the place to do it so I'm being uh, increasingly persuaded Nate to, to your uh, way of thinking on this and so I'm basically prepared to substantially support the document as presented um, uh, I had issues initially with the thirty percent. I thought it should be fifty percent. I was concerned about the the having apartments uh, allowing apartments uh, on on some portions of that. But of course, it doesn't say that they have to be. It just says that they can. And your comment of a moment ago was that it doesn't preclude uh, uh, um, some level of mixed use. And and thirty percent of the first floor is a pretty minimal <laughs> metric of mixture. So generally speaking, I'm uh, I'm I'm good to go with this. Uh, I have uh, I had a question: Is there a reason why sorority and fraternity buildings shouldn't be put here? I mean, I don't think I particularly argue for them being there. But is is there if if a soror what would be the problem with a sorority being there if they wanted it? Is that uh, is is that a, a preclusion that we need to have? Um, that's a question you can answer. And then on the last page, just a drafting thing uh, in the, uh, of course, you, you, I would always encourage instead of use of bullets to use numbers and letters, because then I can precisely reference the design guideline item five, uh, which uh, is the only uh, paragraph or sentence in the whole text that talks about parking lot should not face and should be located behind buildings. Everywhere else it shall. And I wonder whether that's just a, a, an oversight on your part or whether there's a particular reason why you want to use the conditional on that particular sentence and nowhere else. So those are my two comments. Um, 
um, uh, and I, I, I could, um, I think I can support 500 feet um, as the uh, uh, zones of exclusion for apartment buildings. All right, thanks, Bruce. Janet? So I have to confess to being really perplexed about the process. Um, you know, we've been talking about this overlay district, you know, this, you know, this year. And, you know, we've offered comments. Um, they were summarized at the last meeting. And every time we get a proposal from the planning department, it not only ignores the comments, it goes further in the direction in a direction away from what people are concerned about. And um, so I just I'm not sure why we're, you know, I mean. It would seem really clear to me that the board very firmly supported having mixed use buildings on University Drive with some percentage, at least 30% of commercial and retail space, maybe somewhere in the building, but the front facing facades should be, you know, we're looking for a vibrant commercial retail district offices, people living there, walk, you know, working there. Um, you know, someone who's going to the big Y can stop and have a beer somewhere and just, you know, the whole thing. And so I think we've been really, most of us have been very clear on that. And now I think that is gone. I think that we are going to lose um, existing businesses that are there. It will eventually, I mean, the most lucrative thing for a builder to build is an apartment building or a dorm, right? And, um, you know, if, you know, and so that is what's going to happen. I'm particularly concerned about like the parts of University Drive that have shopping centers, which have always, you know, grocery stores have a very low margin. Nursing homes are going out of business in Massachusetts. Um, we have a one story where a nursing home, you know, next to a healthcare facility. And, you know, I was going to suggest that we eliminate the um, office park from the overlay because we want to keep those businesses there. Um, and so I, I can't support this proposal. It seems, you know, it's not only, it's not incorporating what we said last time, it's, you know, it's just, it's getting more and more narrow. And to me, when I read it, I thought, wow, this looks like a developer's dream, like no parking requirement, no mixed use requirement, maximum amount of buildings. Um, and, you know, you know, and then I was thinking, well, at least if it was a 40B, there'd be an incl inclusionary zoning requirement over, 10 or 12%, I think it's 20% or 25%. And so I think this is too much and I can't support it. I could support, you know, if you're gonna go to an apartment building that 25% of the units have to be affordable. If it's a social dorm, 25% are affordable to students because they can't afford to live in our town anymore. But there's no, it's a lot of give and there's no give back. And I, you know, we, I don't, if the planning department feels like this is their vision, you know, continue on, but to keep asking us our opinions and then ignoring them, you know, and of course, of course a developer can build a three, a four story building with mixed use. Barry Roberts has a proposal for that on the corner of Amity Street and University Drive. So, you know, there it is. And it's kind of a nice looking thing and it's supported by the people nearby. Of course, he could build that further down University Drive. And if we're giving more height, more density, let's get something for the town and let's create the vision that we were talking about. And, and you know, no one is going to convert an apartment building to commercial storefronts. I've heard from architects over and over again, really difficult to do, really expensive. Um, you know, once your commercial space, your commercial space, it's hard to convert to apartments. So you know, if no, if we rezone it, adding height and density, requiring mixed use buildings only, um, and protecting, you know, the, the businesses that we want, like the nursing home and the, um, um, you know, the healthcare facility, you know, and nobody builds it, then we can come back and do it again. This is not the only moment um, we have here. So I can't support this and it's drafted you know, maybe the planning board will have a different proposal than the planning department, but we need to put stuff in here for the town and for the townspeople and take our vision. And I just don't think we can just watch, you know, sections of our town turn into apartment buildings and dorms and just hope for the best. All right, thanks, Janet. Fred? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm one of the people on the planning board who, uh, 
was quite insistent about the uh, uh, desirability of uh, uh, shifting the uh, the uh, tax base of Amherst more towards commercial. Um, and so it probably will be a surprise to many of you uh, that I am now uh, uh, had a change of heart here. Uh, I think uh, the time has come to uh, definitively shift the market away from the enormous economic pressures that is uh, now evident in the general residence zoning district. And uh, uh, I, I have had a, uh, a, a significant change of heart here. I do think we might look at the dimensional uh, uh, limitation on apartments and possibly increase those footage numbers from something higher than 500, particularly on the north end of this, uh, which is something we need to look at closely. Uh, but uh, we are going to lose entire neighborhoods. Uh, we're already seeing it. And uh, it, I, 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 <laughs> this, this is needed. And uh, I'm willing to say, okay, uh, you know, nothing's perfect, but uh, yeah, uh, we have got to shift the uh, economic, uh, the, the market uh, that is endangering uh, the livable neighborhoods that now exist in Amherst and won't exist. Uh, unless something definitive is done. So, uh, yeah, I've definitely had a change of heart on this. Uh, it is very important on this one that, you know, if, <laughs> as it were, if if we build it, that, that they in fact come. All right, thanks. Thanks, Fred. Um... I guess the hands that I see are people that have already commented. So before we move on, um, I want to give Karen a chance to comment, and then I want to make a couple of comments. Karen, do you want to say anything? Um, you know, I thank you, Nate, for concretely putting this all down. I think that was really needed, and it was really helpful. Um, I'm not ready to push either way. I do understand what Jesse's saying that it concerns me that that, that yes and and what Janet is saying the most lucrative thing of course is to build college dormitories so that's what's going to happen in a way we need it I I'm pushing so much for ways to have the university take over that job uh quickly so the town doesn't have to do all that work but I'm still listening and I'm finding myself going back and forth with everyone that speaks. So I wish I could add more wisdom, but I'm kind of on the receiving end going back and forth. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, I guess I'll say uh, that by and large, I, I support this, this measure. Um, I think that it, it does allow developers to dream and that's not a bad thing. Um, and that, you know, many of our most vibrant cities were, have been substantially shaped by developers. Um, and to, I, I disagree that it doesn't give the town anything. I think that it does, gives the town a pressure relief valve for the pressures on our residential neighborhoods. And that to me, along with the tax revenue that's likely to come from this, is quite substantial and would be of great value to the town. So I, I disagree with the, some of the comments that have been made. Um, I, I, I have a question for you, Nate, about one aspect, which is the, the proportion of unit mixes and leaving that until site plan review 
seems kind of late in the developer's process. And, you know, if I were a developer, I wouldn't really want to get too far into it without knowing what the planning board is going to tell me I have to have for my proportional mix. Mm -hmm. And so are you expecting that we this will prompt developers to ask to meet with us before a site plan review? Um, actually, that actually reminds me one question I had was, who, which of the two bodies in town is the permitting authority for this? Is it planning board or is it zoning board? And so I'll just pose those two questions to you right now. Yeah, sorry, I'm just writing them down. Um, I mean, I was envisioning this being a you know, site plan review through the planning board. So the per planning board would be the permit granting authority. Uh, and then in terms of site plan review, you know, typically we'll, you know, um, we meet with developers. And so, you know, if this is the standard and condition in the bylaw, they'll see that, you know, before, you know, they're getting, before they actually get to site plan review, right? So they'd see the bylaw and say, what is allowed? And staff would say, well, here's what the, you know, typically what the planning board is looking for. And, you know, it, it you know, do we, you know, at one point we said at least, you know, 10% is three bedrooms or more, or no more than 50% be the same bedroom count. But, um, you know, we could point to other places in the bylaw and say, here's, you know, or other other um, approved projects and say, here's what we've been looking for. And so it's something that's, you know, likely a developer would approach staff before they submit a site plan review application and say, okay, what does this mean? Um, you know, it's a prompt for, for that discussion. And, you know, we could have, uh, you know, some of the discussion staff had was, well, you know, do we be so prescriptive that there's no you know, they can't vary it, right? So if we say it shall be 30% this size and shall be that size and there's no waivers, then you're kind of stuck. Uh, and so, you know, typically a developer will go through the bylaw with staff or have their team to understand what the conditions are. All right, well, um, uh, that, you know, even if they, that prompts them to come and talk to town staff, you know, ultimately it's not staff that's gonna be approving the site plan review. So I would think that, you know, it would, it would certainly be incumbent on you, if not the developer to raise the issue at a, a planning board meeting. Right, well, I think, yeah. I mean, some of it would be telling the developer that, you know, we're not, the board wouldn't approve all one bedrooms. And so- Well, well how do you know that? That's what I don't you know. Understand. I mean, we'd say, you know, so Barry's project, when he went to the ZBA for a variance, he built those buildings as shells without having the interior layout, right? So the architects had all those nice renderings, those 3D renderings that were in the paper without even having floor plans. And so they had a rough floor plan, but they probably had the ability to change bedroom sizes and still keep the exterior appearance pretty similar. And so, I'll, you know, I think a developer can get to the point where they have a rough building footprint and design and can get to the site plan review because typically we don't get to the interior anyways and say it's a double loaded corridor the planning board wants a mix of different bedroom counts they could do that right i mean and so if they're already so set that they're not going to even change a floor plan it because the planning board right now even in site plan review could say we don't like the front of that building we want to push back five feet and the developer is going to say well then i'm gonna lose four bedrooms or four units because i want to have four bedroom you know four bedroom units there now you're making me have three and the way the walls line up. And it's like, well, that's what it's going to take to get through the approval process. And so for me, a developer can come to site plan or view and not actually know what the interior of the building is going to look like. They can have a rough idea in terms of a double loaded corridor. And here's like the layout of bedrooms. But if the board says, you know, we want to have this kind of mix, they should have that ability to, to change it. And maybe, you know, and so, uh, it, you know, that might be more of a conversation than during the permit process than we've had. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess as having worked on a bunch of dormitories in particular, but you know, multifamily things, you you one of the tools is to use the larger windows that you can get with a lit at a living space, as opposed to the smaller windows that are probably at the bedrooms, and the and the rhythm of the of the uh, elevations is highly informed by the type of unit that is behind it. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 would, I wouldn't know what to draw, you know, for that site plan review without at least having in mind how many 
uh, yeah. unit, what, what the units would be. So I think it would be more likely that we would see projects show up with a particular unit mix that they're saying, we, this is what we'd like to do. Yep. And, and then we could talk about, well, is that okay with us? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, like right now, someone is going to stack, you know, bigger bedrooms in the corners in yeah. certain areas. And so, um, you know, I think there's a pattern to how it gets developed, but I think, you know, having this as a condition does allow the, the planning board to say here, we want to see, you know, here's what you're proposing. Is there, could you vary it a bit? Right. And right. so, you don't have to accept what's provided and, you know, and applied for, you have the ability to then ask for, for changes. Okay. All right. So um, I see three board member hands and Chris, your hand is up. I'm going to let you, you want to interject in this topic? Yeah. I wanted to know if the planning board is therefore welcoming developers to come in and speak with them early on in the process to talk about these issues of size of units, et cetera. Is that I, something that I, I you certainly, would appreciate? I certainly would. I, I think one yeah. of the frustrations I've had with this pro with our permit process is that we don't see things early enough to, mm -hmm. to influence the sort of fundamental site uh, layout, I guess, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, I was unhappy with the, the project down on Main Street and I hoped that it could have been otherwise, but by the time we saw it, it was pretty well baked in. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay um, all right, so let's go ahead and we'll go through the the other hands. Um, and um, Janet. Thank you. Um, I have some, so I was wanted to point out that Fieldstone, which is an appealing building, partly because the materials used and the changes in the facades also has all along the street front, it's not bedrooms, it's, you know, it's a coffee shop, it's people working out and it's very welcoming. Like I felt like walking into it, you know? And so I, I think that we shouldn't lose that kind of vitality that first floor um, activities can create um, and also a sense of community. I wondered if you've done a calculation on the number of units that would be lost by having 30% requiring 30% um, in a mixed use building, like, are you gonna lose 500 units on your street? I mean, it sounds like, you know, it's like, have you done that calculation? Are you gonna lose 200? Um, I don't think this is gonna be a deal breaker for a developer getting many extra stories. And, um, but I'm just wondering is, can you quantify that? You know, um, so if you're looking for like thousand to 1200, you know, units, which I don't know, multiple bedrooms, that's like thousands of people um, moving into university drive. But, you know, if you pick off some bedrooms, you know, for the 30%, do you have an idea of how much that is? My second question is, I'm not opposed to the University Drive as a student housing district. It's been suggested in many of our plans. I would like to, I wondered if you had looked at other college towns and universities that had, university towns that had set up a housing district and figure, you know, talk to them about what worked and what didn't. Were the what were the impacts good and bad and so or you know lessons learned like what would you do differently, and so we can kind of use that knowledge. So those are two questions. Um, Nate, before you answer, I was just going to point out uh, the Fieldstone project has two buildings. You know, there's the front building that faces Mass Ave that does have some commercial space in it, but the rear building is entirely housing units. For graduate students, and um, you know, it does not have any commercial space in it. So, for the record, yeah, I mean, it, um, I think it, the vitality is on the street for sure. Yeah, Nate, anything you want to say there? I mean, I know you started with some images at, at other university towns. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea about the mixed uses, it's not the units, it's then say the parking or other requirements that a non-residential space would have. And so it's not just like, oh, it's, you know, 5,000 square feet of non-residential space. It's like, what are the other needs of that space in relationship to the site? And so it's not just like, oh, you know, so saying um, if we, you know, if, if there's an existing project and it's like, yeah, we have 10,000, we're proposing 10,000 square feet of retail you could say, well, that's so many units. It's then, well, you know, 
if they want to put certain uses in there, then that drives the parking. It might drive site amenities and plaza space or outdoor dining. And so it changes the whole project. It's not just like a one for one, 10,000 square feet equals, you know, 30 units or something. It's, it's really, it's not that simple of a calculation. Um, so, you know, I think that's where, it, you know, when we spoke with two developers, they were saying that, you know, 30%, if, if that's what it was, they might just build buildings and then leave them vacant. And maybe that's okay, but it's not really the envision that, you know, you'd build them and they just, it would sit. And so, uh, you know, if there was a, you know, we think the 15% on the interior actually would might, might get used and maybe it, maybe it needs to, um, maybe it, it should be a shell in some areas. And so that there's still some mixed use happening. Um, in terms of other college towns, we're not actually saying this is a student housing district. We're allowing apartments or mixed use buildings. And so, you know, when this was discussed earlier, that, you know, the conversation was, well, let's just allow market rate development and see, you know, anyone could live there. And so what we've talked about is that, you know, a percentage of these buildings could be non-students, right? It could be um, anyone who wants to live there. And so if we wanted to say that this is just a student housing district, it would look a lot different, I think, in terms of the language. And so we're not saying that necessarily. And so I, I think that that's the difference. Some places would say, yeah, let's make this a student housing overlay. And the only thing that's allowed is social dormitories, right? No mixed use buildings, no apartments. It's only social dormitories. Let's make it six stories, absolutely no parking. And we're just going to make, you know, we're going to put thousands and thousands of beds there. And we could do that, right? And that's what some communities have done, but that's not what we're saying, you know? So uh, I think that, um, you know, I had initially came out and said that last year, like, what if we made this a student housing overlay? And the discussion was saying, well, let's actually let it be, you know, market development that can be for anyone. And if students choose to live there, sure, but others won't. And so, you know, I spoke with Archipelago and they said in, you know, two of their downtown buildings, you know, probably a third of the, of the residents are non-students. And so, you know, they, they say, they said it's easy that they can get that or more every time. It's, it's just, you know, so although people could say, oh, it's always students, they say they have a pretty large percentage non-students and, you know, that could happen down on University Drive. And so we're not restricting or excluding any potential tenants or residents. All right. Um, next hand is from Jesse. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm not really feeling the argument for eliminating the mixed use everywhere. Meaning, okay, so developers saying, they'll just build it and leave it vacant. To me, that's better than not having the possibility. And I don't, from what we've seen in town, might be vacant for some time, but long run, they're not gonna leave it vacant. They're gonna figure out a way to use it. And as Janet pointed out, I think once that goes, once that's not included, it's never coming back. And that's really what I'm thinking about is not the next two years when these things are built, but 10 years, 15 years, what do we, what kind of spaces do we want there? And, and likewise, logically, I feel like, are we really worried that if we require mixed use everywhere, nobody's going to build anything? I don't think that's the reality, right? Because look what's happened in town already. The developers are going to come do it. Whatever we put down, they're going to do it because it's still lucrative. And I agree, developers will figure out what the market wants, how they're going to make money. And that's a very different agenda from, I think, what we are charged with. Right? We're charged with planning for the long term, uh, which is a very different agenda from someone coming in to build this project. And so I would be in favor of uh, encouraging more commercial or mixed use space. All right. Uh, Bruce. Um. I'm in favor of, of moving to resolution of this matter tonight. <clears throat> and okay. uh, um, and I we seem to be very close. We're, we're arguing about specific, uh, a few specific things. Uh, what, uh, Doug, what I think would help here, if uh, Nate has the text that he could put on the screen and we treat it like we do uh, uh, proposed conditions where we could go through these uh, particular items and uh, discuss them uh, and change or modify the language uh, and then uh, have a document that we can uh, 
uh, give uh, whatever instructions we need to give to 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 basically move to the next step here. Because what what's been happening and what will continue to happen if we don't uh, break this cycle is that we'll have a long discussion just as we're having now, just as we've had three or five or six times before. Uh, there'll be a, a necessary break of four or five weeks between that and when we have it next time because of all the other business we have to do. And we'll have the same discussion again. Uh, it'll be slightly different, but it'll amount to the same thing. And 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 we have to, I think, move to resolution of this tonight and recognize that this is not going to be a perfect thing. We have to recognize that this is just a, a damn bylaw that can be changed as easily or more easily than it can be created. So if we see something, this is a big, long strip of town. Uh, if we see a pattern emerging that we don't like, we, we're not stuck with this damn thing. We can change it. We can modify it. So we should not uh, get our heads stuck in the idea that we have to solve this problem for all time. We have to start. And we've got a pretty good starting point here. I'm with Jesse. I think there's a concern about um, uh, apartment buildings. Um, I could say, well, let's see what happens. Um, I, I'm with you, Doug. I think we have to trust that the uh, the development uh, fraternity here are, are uh, for the first time in quite a while in this town, certainly in the 40 years I've been living here, we've got some actually uh, the, uh, the downtown developers who are actually doing something rather than sitting on their backsides and doing nothing, which was 1980s, 1990s and early 2000s. So things have changed for the better, I think, in that regard. And uh, I think we have to trust staff. You know, we, we these folks are uh, employed to support us in this thing, and, and and they've done a lot of research. Nate's particularly, and I think uh, I might disagree with him, or I might be surprised at some of the recommendations he's made. But I'm prepared to to back the judgment now that we've been discussing this, and he keeps uh, um, making arguments and so forth that that I find um, plausible, and I'm prepared to support, even though they might not be exactly in alignment with my instincts, uh, because as I said, we can change it. So I would suggest that, that Nate bring this up on the screen and we go through it and we try and uh, have uh, create a document tonight that we can be satisfied with. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Nate, I've I'll got a whole you... lot of other comments as well, oh, but I prefer oh, to make okay. them in the document. All right. Well, I'll let you think about that, Nate. Um, I will say that if we're going to go through that process, um, I, I guess I'm imagining that for each of the changes, we would need to vote on it. We would need a clear record that, yes, in fact, a majority of the vote of the board wanted it one way or the other way. Is so that what I guess you're envisioning, Bruce? No, I was imagining that we could come to some agreement that we would uh, that, 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 that we would vote on the whole document, but it might be that we need to take a straw po poll as we move through. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've been taking notes. Sorry, and I have like, I have fifteen. Uh, I started using numbers, Bruce. I have fifteen points um, from this discussion, and so I could share the document. I mean, I, I could go through it, but some of it is. Uh, you know, everything from, you know, um, the shells for the parking um, conditions to, you know, a higher percent affordability to the 500 feet from the Amity Street intersection, maybe that's one place where we, you know, have a different, and it doesn't have to be 500 feet across, you know, requiring mixed use buildings. Um, and so we, we could go through the, the um, you know, the, the bylaw, the text now, uh, or we could ha keep having discussion and, you know, on the 26th, would we bring it back? And so, you know, the idea would be any changes would be track change at this point, invisible. Uh, you know, it's up to the board members, I guess. I can do it live, edit in a Word document, or, you know, there's, you know, a number of things that, you know, might be better, you know, spoken between staff, right? So then after this meeting, I can meet with Chris and Rob, Mora and others and say, okay, here's where we're going. You know, for instance, uh, you know, one of my questions after Jana was talking was like, you know, could we require like podium build even on apartments so that in the future, the first floor could be converted? I mean, and so instead of requiring mixed use buildings, could you require a construction method that would allow conversion? And so, I mean, those are the things that I wouldn't have answers to right now, but is that something we'd write into the bylaw, even require a meeting with the planning board or their designees before submitting a site plan review application and make that a condition of the bylaw? And so that an applicant has to come in. And so I, th I think there's 
probably a number of things that I would add or want to talk to staff about. And I think we could keep having this conversation. I feel like, you know, I might have 30 points after this that I'd want to then think about in terms of how it gets incorporated into the bylaw. Well, Nate and Chris, um, you know, it's been my understanding that we wanted to try to get to a vote of this before the current board goes off the board. And that would be Janet and me who are leaving. And so uh, is that in fact an objective or not? It would be, I mean, I guess, you know. All right, so, so you know, our next meeting is our last meeting and we'll have a different board in July. Or maybe not. <laughs> Do you want to try to get back to this next week, next Wednesday, on the twelfth? So, can I? Can I? Uh, oh, oh, okay. I made my comment um, and asked my question. We'll see what where they where we end up. Janet, you're next. So, so we, you know, when we started, when Bruce was starting to do the consensus document, it was like, what do we agree on and build from that. And Nate, the last two times, it's like, instead of, you know, we have our, you did a good job of summarizing our concerns. And then you went off and, you know, at Doug's suggestion, wrote a document that didn't incorporate those concerns and actually were more extreme in away from them. And so I don't know, I, I kind of, I mean, I don't want to spend the whole night discussing this, but, you know, I, I think we're not building a consensus document. We seem to be in this, like, and I said this last time, it's like, who's the decider? Whose document is this? Is this the planning board vision or is this the planning department? And so if you're going further and further away from what we're talking about each time, it, it's not the consensus. It's just creating more division or just a different vision. And that's okay. You know, if I was going to revive this, I'd remove the apartment buildings I would put a 50% requirement of mixed use in a mixed use building and the social dorms. I, you know, I'm fine with the dorms. I would remove the office park to protect the um, the um, medical <laughs> facilities because clearly they, they would be like maybe the first to go, at least the, you know. And so, um, and then, you know, I don't even think we need to let go of, we need to say anything about parking because our bylaw right now is so flexible that basically it says, come to us and make your case, you know, and we'll we'll give it to you pretty much with very little documentation. And so, I mean, do we could spend the whole night talking about this, but the vision, you know, I I, you know, I don't, and I would, you know, if we're gonna do no mixed use or allow apartments, I would increase the inclusionary zoning requirement because that's also the need. You know, we built hundreds and hundreds. We built over a thousand units in our town. We're in a building frenzy, and the prices of the rents have gone up all over in town because these are so expensive. And so, I'm sympathetic to what Fred is saying because you're like, this is a crisis. Um, it's not a crisis of a lack of housing. It's a crisis of the pricing of it, um, and people wanting to live in Amherst. And so, the university is not the escape valve. University Drive can be it, but let's make, and we know they'll build, we know they can afford to build mixed use downtown in the most awkward situation. They can afford to do it on University Drive. Why are we giving that away? And I'm not gonna agree to give that away so I could lose that vote. But if this is, you know, you know, we can talk about this all night, but if, if you wanna go back and revise it, but not include what we're talking about and making it more extreme, that's not a great process. I would go back to Bruce's like building a consensus document. I know okay. that's a lot, but. All right. All right. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd respond I'm, and say that if the bylaw we had or Janet that you just mentioned to me would be a waste of time because it would never get used. And so I wouldn't want to go through months of that discussion and propose an overlay that then wouldn't be implemented. And so you know, going through and saying, let's eliminate the office park, require 50%, don't allow this. You know, we've spoken with developers and different people and they said, you know, that wouldn't get used. And so I wouldn't want to go through the effort of really refining it and coming up with a document that then is not going to get used, right? And so for, from my perspective, the, the, the point is actually housing production. So the problem is units, it's number of beds. And so if we really wanted to address this, I would actually say, make this a house, student housing overlay 
like I said, and do six stories and just only allow students, right? Because then maybe the, the RG and everywhere else in town would actually have less pressure in terms of the price and the conversion of, of families, single family homes into student rentals. And so that is the market. It's not that there's a huge lack of demand and supply, a lack of supply. There's huge demand because there's no supply. Massachusetts has a half million unit shortage of housing. If we wanna have people stay in the communities they've been living in, age in place, have new families and people come in, have more school age children, it's all about supply. It's not about, oh, the prices are high. The prices are high because there's not enough supply. Uh, I mean, it, and, and it's it, expensive to build and it's expensive to build. But, you know, there, like you said, um, Bruce, we had there was very little building for years. And so, you know, unfortunately, it's been a reflexive thing. UMass expanded in the 60s and 70s. The town responded. We changed zoning. There wasn't a lot of building. We changed zoning. There was some building. And now the reflexive nature is, oh, let's do something again. Uh, you know, there was a report commissioned in the 19, 1990 by the state. Is like you know affordability in college communities, and it focused on Amherst in the region, and it's the same thing we're talking about now, you know, thirty years later, and most of it is about supply, and so, you know, so for my 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 thought would be if we had the document that was presented or discussed a few months ago, I would say I I'm not really willing to move that forward because it's not going to get us housing units or what would actually make a difference in for for the for the housing market, and so. You know, the housing trust has been discussing this too. And they're saying, yeah, this is actually a great place, location. Let's try to actually do something different for the housing market so that other areas in town could have different opportunities and have housing opportunity here. And I feel like the document that we've been working on previously wouldn't get us either of those. And so I wouldn't actually continue to work on it. And so if we are saying, well, the document now is not workable for you, you know, for me, it is. And so I would say, well, let's see where we can get to actually have something get utilized to get more beds and units in town. Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, I do think we could increase inclusionary zoning and have more units down here, but I think having 50% mixed use everywhere and parking requirements and all those other things actually create a, an overlay that is not gonna be used. All right, thanks, Nate. Um, Bruce, I guess you're next. Um, I guess we should just remind ourselves that that consensus document that I wrote was a consensus of January. Uh, that's five months ago. I think things have changed. Certainly my mind has changed since it was in January. And uh, so uh, I, 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 I'm with Nate. I think that it's not worth us uh, pursuing something that uh, if we believe that it won't be uh, used. And I'm prepared to take the staff's uh, guidance on this. And I'm certainly also prepared to trust that uh, not everything that all developers do is uh, is um, uh, purely greedy. I think that these folks uh, have a um, have a business integrity, and I think uh, uh, um, if we if we uh, if we create a situation that uh, I think Nate is working towards, then I I want to see what happens. Um, I think that's reasonable. As I said, we can change it. So, Nate, if you don't want to, uh, you've got some reasons why you might want to go back to staff and uh, and redraft this. Uh, but um, uh, I think Doug, you're right. We should we should make a decision. If not tonight, then then before the end of the month. And I think that uh, Nate, from my point of view. Um, uh, it's the vitality on University Drive that I want to preserve, and I see apartments uh, getting in the way of that uh, potentially. Uh, but of course, it's not that that uh, bylaw that 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 language that you last drafted is requiring apartments; it's simply allowing apartments. And as I said earlier, if it looks like we've got too many of them, we can do something about it. I probably would suggest that we change 500 to a thousand feet. And maybe from one or maybe both directions, and uh, but whatever. I, 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 my big, my big concern is that we want to ex, we want to uh, maintain the business activity on that street. I think something that Doug said earlier but suggests that when you start building a lot of houses there, there will become a force that suggests that that is uh, going to happen anyway. So I, I don't want us to try and. Uh, micromanage this thing. I think we have to have some trust 
And, and Janet, I, 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 I think I'm speaking to you and you know that here, because I think that that we we have to we have to have some faith here, and uh, and that the the world won't uh, uh, crash uh, be again. Us, I think. Uh, I I don't share your concerns that uh, that what uh, Nate has substantially uh, uh, drafted is 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 not in our best interest. I think it can be sharpened in the ways I've mentioned and in the ways that Jesse's mentioned, and uh, but uh, I'm substantially. Um, good with what we've got and uh and i probably could i could support a process where tonight we went through it but i didn't know that everybody else has got that uh stamina and uh and nate seems to have other conversations he wants so i'll i'll withdraw that suggestion and hope that we can do it uh and come prepared to do it next time we meet on this because right, i wanted to move forward all right thanks bruce um all right, so there's three hands up, and Jesse and Janet, you guys have talked a couple of times, so I'm going to let Karen go next. Yeah, briefly, I do want, uh, Nate, you suggested that we maybe have a bylaw that uh, asks developers to meet with us before the site plan review. I think that's great. I saw what a difference it made on Sunset Avenue. I think Barry Roberts was grateful to have all our input and it certainly changed the product. So uh, I would encourage you to put that in. And otherwise I, I agree with Bruce, I would like this to come to uh, a vote uh, pretty soon. And, um, and I'm also being persuaded that we need to go into this direction to preserve the rest of the, the, um, the, the town. And we are in a kind of a crisis. But I also met with Mindy Dome uh, at her open meeting at the Jones Library, which is at the end of every month. And she said this bonding bill, which is in front of the, um, the uh, state government right now, concentrates on housing. It's gonna go, on through, go, through, go through very quickly. And one of the biggest concerns that they have is providing uh, housing for workers and staff. She she wanted me to just kind of back off on the, uh, I kept pushing that we need to have affordable housing for students. And she said, it's not just students, it's the staff, faculty, all these things. And that's what they're really pushing for. So there'll probably be something coming from the government to support uh, incentives to build that kind of housing. Okay, thank, thank you, Karen. All right. Janet, and you've got your hand up. Jesse took his down. I wonder if um, maybe Nate and the housing subcommittee could work on, you know, an, another draft and come back in two weeks or so, two weeks or three weeks, I can't remember, um, you know, with something to sort of hash it out. Because um, I also wonder if there's any public comment. I've been wondering about that myself. But, you know, I, I think that I don't, you know, we know we know you can build mixed use buildings in downtown Amherst that have, you know, 30%, you know, of, you know, commercial space or retail space for years, there was the claim that they couldn't do 10% um, inclusionary zoning and no one documented anything with numbers. And even, you know, people on the zoning subcommittee got tired of that. And we pushed that through and we, voila, we have mixed use buildings downtown you know with unlimited you know amount of units no parking and we have a 10 percent affordable or 10 or 12 percent and so I, if you can do it downtown why can't we do it on university drive even if you gave them a sixth floor get something in return you know like we're giving people an economic incentive barry roberts is building a four-story building i think or five stories that does this in the same place and so i think it's an act of faith that we have a lucrative market. We have a slightly rising population. We don't have a half million people like Boston does. Um, and we have housing pressures on us. And it's an, it's an act of faith that we build, we put in some good zoning, require some good, good looking buildings that do something for the community that it will get built. It's getting built now. I have no idea why they wouldn't build it on University Drive. All right, thanks, Janet. Um, so Nate, uh, and Chris, uh, do you 
are you guys, do you guys want to take this back and tweak it a bit more and come back on the 26th? I'm, I'm seeing Chris shake her head. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think I, I wouldn't mind going through like the 20 points I have, um, you know, and just seeing where we are. So, you know, if we go in reverse order, you know, we could talk about the inclusionary um, percentage. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I would be willing to say, let's have a six story, maybe step back some distance. We don't even say step back. If uh, in, in addition to the 12%, they have 8% units go up to 150 AMI. And so then all of a sudden you have, you know, a missing middle component and you're at 20% of, of units that are um, non-students. And, you know, the 8% becomes a local thing we have to work with. 150 AMI is published by HUD. Anyway, staff's talked about this. It was kind of like, oh, uh, um, you know, I've, I've talked about this, having this actually increasing our inclusionary zoning across town with something like this to get at housing that's more than 80%. And so what staff has found is that 80% actually is too expensive for a lot of people. And ideally we'd have, you know, units that uh, match the voucher payment standards, which is, you know, whatever, 70, 72% or something, but, you know, 80% is one of those, it's a definition, it's in the state. So for affordable units, we have it be 80% or below, but, you know, everyone just goes to 80 and then they have a hard time filling units, but they can voluntarily lower it. Developers don't like doing that. But anyways, yeah, I mean, I, so some of these things that I, we could talk about tonight or Chris and I could go back and talk to different staff about, um, you know, I'd kind of be curious to see where the planning board is, is with that. Um, this section of University Drive is 2,600 uh, linear feet. So right now at 500 feet, we're left with a, like 1,600, you know, feet of road. You know, if we did 750 feet, from each intersection, you know, that gets us, you know, north of CVS and um, below like the ATM building, right? And so then you're left with, um, you know, a thousand linear feet where you could have something else other than mixed use built, you know, you could have apartments or social dormitories. So that means, you know, 1500 feet of the 2600 feet can only be mixed use buildings. And then there's a thousand feet in the middle that could also be social dormitories or apartments. And given the buildings that are there and wetland constraints, you know, looking online, that's maybe three, maybe four sites to be developed. And so you'd have all of University Drive and you'd have maybe four non-mixed use buildings. And so, you know, I mean, is that something, you know, for instance, like, is that, I, I don't mind talking about it more tonight, if that, you know, will give us direction, staff direction uh, moving forward. All right. Um... Well, if anybody wants to comment on Nate's uh, sort of what Nate uh, raised as a possibility, let's first talk uh, uh, adding a sixth story in um, in return for adding some uh, some affordable units that are defined above the AMI sort of for the missing middle. How do people feel about that? I'm seeing two thumbs up. Fred is not. Uh, I'm. I'm going to say I'm. I'm not in favor of that. Uh, I guess I figured out my limit on height was five stories. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, so I. I. I prefer not to have six story buildings. That to me is just a little bit beyond the kind of human scale that I'm comfortable with. Um, and uh, so that's that's my reaction to it. We uh, require really low ceilings, dog, in these buildings, though. Yeah, so yeah. Still only be well, like keep them under story. sixty feet, huh? So you won't get much of a commercial level. <laughs> um, so, did anybody want to put else want to put their thumb up or down? Um, Karen or Janet or Fred? Uh, Fred's a down. Um, and I guess Karen and Janet are not going to comment on that. Um, I, I see everybody's hand. I know there's a bunch of hands up. Um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm trying to do this sort of quickly. Uh, maybe that's a mistake. Um, and, and the other thing, Nate, was your expansion of the mixed use only zone closer into the middle going from 500 to 750. How do people feel about that? Jesse's got a thumbs up. Bruce doesn't know. Fred's against it. Um, Karen's in favor. Janet doesn't know. 
I'm kind of wishy-washy myself. So, I, you know, Doug, I have questions, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, you, I'm sure. Um, what, what, uh, uh, okay. Um, so you got a little bit of response there, Nate, and now we'll go back to some more comments. So Janet, you are number four. JS Jesse, go ahead. Thank you. Just quickly, I completely agree with two of Bruce's sentiments. One, that we should move this along. Two, that it's not fixed in stone, that we can always revisit. But with that in mind, the logic to me is backward. Like, why wouldn't we try for what we think is a good solution? I'm thinking of the mixed use. And if we put that as a requirement, and then in six months we have zero proposals, we could say, oh, the, the it was absolutely correct. Nobody wants to use this by law. Then we could relax it versus the other way where then we have every lot proposed without any commercial use. And then what do we do? Do we then start picking and choosing and saying, well, this one's okay because it was in first. And then the next three, we have to change the bylaw. So I don't know, just wanted to make that maybe reversal of process suggestion. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Bruce. Hey, sorry. I just, um, sorry, one. Okay. Uh, Nate. was moving around on me. Um, so if we require mixed use buildings, um, would we, could we require with say a varying percentage, um, say after 500 feet or some distance? So, you know, instead of 30%, maybe it's less, but we have, we would require, I mean, then, then only the old, overlay really is, it's only mixed use buildings, say along the street, maybe the, maybe a secondary building behind it wouldn't be, uh, but we'd have require some mixed use percentage on the street facing uh, buildings. I'm seeing a number of heads nodding yes on that, including one thumbs up. So that's that's something to think about, Nate. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Bruce. Oh, oh dear. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> if you remember. I think I do. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, yeah, that's right, this was hard to do definitively. Uh, one of the reasons that I supported more stories was I remembered the uh, reason why Barry Roberts wanted his variance, and that was because of the particularly lousy foundation down there, and he was looking for higher, uh, more floors would give him, uh, uh, he, could, he, he could spread that uh, foundation premium over more floors. So the argument could be made that this is a site where height is ge geotechnical situations drive higher buildings, and and I and I was putting my hand, thumbs up for that because I really wanted uh, Nate to figure out whether that's true. Uh, I think Mara, Mara might you might have talked to some developers about that, but if that was true, if that's a particular circumstance of this site or this area, then we probably should know about it. Then it wouldn't be unreasonable for us to adjust our our, um, our, our overlay accordingly. So that was that one. Secondly, uh, the question related to uh, apartment buildings uh, being denied uh, within certain distances from the intersections at either end, uh, that's one mechanism. I, I had another mechanism in mind, which I uh, was wondering whether would be more suitable, uh, and that is minimum spacing kind of mechanism. Uh, and the reason for that is because it, it seems to me that the, the mechanism of, of having uh, um, basically uh, um, allowing apartment buildings in the center part of the thing, but not at either end, uh, notionally might uh, mean that the center part of the, 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 uh, the uh, drive, uh, university drive would be a less vital place because there would be less retail activity in the storefront. My general sense is that if we could uh, uh, drive uh, some kind of retail activity or some kind of commercial activity at the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the street front all the way along, it would be good. That would be the goal. And I, uh, and I, I don't see why we shouldn't, as Je Jesse said, try for that as being what we really would like to do. And uh, figure out a way in which the, that, 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 that we can imagine that this would be a, a, an attractive, uh, make it attractive to developers. I'm, I'm respectful of your knowledge of having talked to developers and getting a sense of what what is possible. And I don't want us to be dreaming about what would be nice, but what wouldn't uh, be driven. I also know 
that many years ago I created a co-housing community here in North Amherst when the whole of the development world thought I was crazy. And then uh, about three or four years afterwards, the, the same people were coming from all over the country to see these places because they were uh, they were what Amherst suddenly became proud of. So I, I so I'm I'm ACDC on this, but I'm 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 trusting your 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 instincts, but 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 don't don't let us down. Um, and uh, uh, that's it for now. I can't think of the other three things I was going to say. Okay. Uh, Fred. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm in, in very much impressed by the argument that, uh, <clears throat> you know, that uh, we can't go through all of this process and end up with something that's not used. Um, what I wanted to talk about was the uh, distance at each end. And I think rather than just throw out numbers of either 500 feet or 750 feet or something, I would say uh, <clears throat> simply no more than what is already developed. Whatever that distance is, uh, don't extend it further and, then, and you know get a measurement on that and use that as the parameter. Uh, and then let's uh, let's take some economic pressure off of the uh, other neighborhoods in the town, and that means uh, moving forward with this. Thank you. So you would uh, not allow apartments within the zone that is already commercial, so that the mixed use stays is is exclusively within the commercial zone, but then apartments are allowed where there isn't commercial now. Yeah, uh, basically, let's take as much pressure off the rest of the town as we can. Okay. All right. And Janet, we're back to you. So speaking to them, I think the most of the members of the housing subcommittee would, is this something that you would like to hash out with Nate? like meet and hash this out. Cause I think this could go on for like till two in the morning or 10 30, which is also way past my bedtime. Um, I also wonder if you could, if anyone wants to have public comment, cause we might be just losing our, you know, whoever's left. So I just, I just, you know, do we want to just keep talking for hours or do, can we just put this into a forum where we can have more detailed conversation and kind of hash things out or do we want to stay here? Because, you know, part of it is like, you know, Nate, when you were talking about all only three or four apartment buildings, you know, with your distancing, I was like, is that on both sides of the street? You know, like a question like that, it, you know, I don't know that, you know, that would be a question that could be discussed a little bit or, you know, in a in the housing subcommittee as people kind of go through language and stuff. But does the housing subcommittee want to do this with Nate or is, am I just insane? And then could we have public comment? Uh, Jesse? Uh, I think certainly we could. Uh, I certainly would, would not be opposed to that. Um, I'm not sure it would be a more efficient process than here. Maybe it would be, but it might not be. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll I, mean, say... I was gonna, I was going to say that um, you know, Chris actually suggested an additional meeting, which maybe that could be the case if we wanted to get to a vote by the end of June. I mean, honestly, from the comments, I've um, I'm at about twenty points from this meeting. Um, you know, my thought would be if the board really wants to see mixed use to have keep the 500 feet from the intersections and then uh, everywhere else require mixed use buildings along the street at, you know, 15 or 20 percent and that back buildings don't have to be. And honestly, nothing, nothing else would really change with the overlay. We're still allowing apartments in sororities or for social dormitories as long as they're not street facing. Any street facing building has to have a certain percentage of mixed use. Um, I mean, that's kind of where I'm leaning. Yeah. You know, I think that resolves a lot of the conversation um, tonight. You know, I hear that six stories is too high for building code. Only, honestly, only from and, one member. <laughs> no, but I, so Bruce Doug. said something about like building and code and everything. Really, it's at seven stories is where building code and everything else yeah. starts to become efficient. And that to yeah. me, that's too high. So if five floors is what we want, it, it doesn't, six stories isn't going to help a developer out any more than five is in terms of 
efficiencies and say a building or other things. And so, I mean, they'll have more units, but um, so, I mean, I'm kind of leaning towards what I suggested. I think that would uh, yeah. get a lot. I think I would, I would try to see if we can say shell for the Western access drive, you know, it's a requirement that it be used. Uh, the parking I'd look at in terms of, can we require that stuff? Um, a meeting before with a planning board or, or a planning designee or planning board designees before application. And um, honestly, I feel like that addresses a lot of the, the concerns. Uh, so those would right. be kind of well, the three so, or four changes. So do we, do we want it? Chris, wasn't there a reason we didn't have a meeting on the 19th? Was that because it was Juneteenth? Yes, but there is also um, June twelfth, which is um, Wednesday. Oh, that's so next week, right? You could do the do a, another meeting next week and focus only on this topic. All right. Well, I can't be sure that I would be here on the twelfth, but maybe I'm the only one. Um, so, Jesse, can I just add we had planned to have a subcommittee meeting on the twelfth anyway, which is four of us, so that could work fine, I think. You have your meetings in the evening? Yeah. So you could have your meeting on the 12th and then whoever else could join, um, could join. Is that, is that reasonable? Sounds okay. like a plan. And how do you, how do you feel about meeting with this housing subcommittee? How, how do I feel? Yeah. Are you fine? With, you know, are you good with that? I mean, you sounded like you wanted to talk to Rob and maybe Chris some more. I don't know. Yeah, we'll but, talk by Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I attended the last meeting. I figured I'd attend this one. If, you know, and if some of it is getting some of those details worked out and then bringing something back to the planning board on the 26th, yeah. then I would feel, you know, good about that, that, you know, we're trying to get, you know, uh, my thought too would be that that's what would happen on the 26th is the planning board to recommend this. And then it would still get reviewed and referred back to the planning board. Right. So there would still be months of conversation, but at least it would get it to the point where, you know, it's been, um, it started an official process. You know, right now we're calling it a zoning amendment. Really, it's just a, you know, a concept for a zoning amendment that if the board sponsors it, then it can move forward. Otherwise, you know, otherwise it's right now it's really, you know, it's just kind of a, a planning concept. Right. Um, and who was on the housing subcommittee? I can't remember. Uh, Jesse, Bruce, Karen, and Janet. Okay. All right. I, I'm, not, I can't, I'm not on the committee. I, I don't think I can come next Wednesday. It's so Fred, Karen, it's Fred. Karen could not make it. Okay. But Fred, Fred is. Oh, okay. It'll be Bruce, Fred, and I. Okay. And maybe Bruce. Yes, I'm on. Uh, I'm on that, but but Janet, so Janet can attend, you know, either as an invitee or as a member of the public, as as she did before. So it's kind of pretty open, I think. Yep. Okay, Janet, I see your hand. I had an idea that maybe if you know having Rob Mora come might be helpful, and maybe making the meeting a little earlier so staff doesn't have to stay late. So because Rob is a just has a ton of info. Okay, well, food for thought, Nate. All right, um, so maybe that's where we leave it at the moment. Um, okay, Jesse? One yeah. more question for, I guess, really for Nate. Are you willing to do that? And what time will be best for you? Because it feels like if we're gonna try and address this, it'd be great if you could be there. But I don't, it, you know, don't wanna put more pressure on you to- I mean. Honestly, it doesn't really matter if it's, you know, uh, you know, if it's at five or six, I'm still, it's in the evening. It doesn't benefit me either way. Right. So either it would have to be at like, you know, four or three or like 10 at night. <laughs> so, um, I know it doesn't bother me either. You know, if we, if we're sticking at six or six thirty, we could just stick with that. I don't, you know, unless for some reason, some subcommittee members can't make it at that time, but otherwise we can just keep it at the regular time. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, 
So I guess we'll leave it there. I guess I will ask, are there any members? There's four members of the public who are still here. Uh, did any of you want to make a public comment before we close the conversation this evening? Um, I am not seeing any hands raised, so maybe that's, oh, okay, here's Janet Keller. Pam, if you can bring her over. Hi, Janet, you would need to unmute yourself. Janet, you need to unmute. There you go. Thank you. Um, I, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. Um, to be perfectly honest, um, I would like to put in a passionate uh, request um, that you um, address the wetlands um, issues, which to me are really, really big. Um, and we've seen how um, a very talented lawyer can um, work with those um I, I, so if there's a way to address that at all in the zoning um i think that's critically important rather than leaving it uh to case by case uh, especially since we've seen um the flooding um i think the mixed use um is really important and um hope uh that you um, uh, protect it and six stories is too high and parking is critical. Um, those are a few things that come to mind, but um, frankly, um, the pace and um, the scope of this discussion, um, which I think the public was not expecting to happen, so I guess I would um, ask um, that you well advertise this so that people can um, weigh in. Um, and um, I appreciate the liveliness and thoughtfulness of, of all who have worked on this and spoken tonight. Thank you. All right, thanks, Janet. Um, as for the publicity, I will say that as as Nate mentioned, uh, this is really just the start of a process. It would go to town council, probably be referred to CRC, uh, back to town council, then to the planning board for public hearings, and ultimately back to town council. So uh, it's quite likely that anybody that wants to pay attention to it, if they haven't heard about it yet, will hear about it before it gets too far along. Um, Janet, did I don't did a press release go out and everybody ignored it or like they found it so interesting? Did because that was what we were talking about last time, I think. Uh, Can I say something? Yeah, I Chris. think we've been um, overwhelmed with the amount of work that we have to do here in the planning department, and we probably forgot okay. about a press release. Um, okay. To be quite frank, it's just okay. we feel like we're under the ocean. Like we're at Jones Beach and the waves are pounding us. That's what that we a, feel like. That is a vivid image that describes a lot of my childhood. <laughs> Getting hit by Jones Beach waves. So okay. All right. So we it's the time is 932 and we will close that conversation. Now we'll go on to our other regularly scheduled events here. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I just wanted to mention the the um, wetlands and stormwater. You know, the town there is. I don't want to say it's new, but you know, kind of newer permitting and stormwater review for projects in Amherst and you know, uh, University Drive has a number of wetland resource areas, and so I, you know, that'll be looked at very carefully by the Conservation Commission and uh, Public Works, and so mm -hmm. you know, even. The variance that was granted by the ZBA, that's still has to get before the planning board and the conservation commission. And so the conservation commission still has a really thorough review to do of that project in terms of stormwater management, any mitigation or anything else. And so I, that's any project on University Drive. I think that uh, any development here or redevelopment will actually 
be expensive for a developer because they'll have to figure out how to manage stormwater, right? It can't be a net increase from what's there. And so oftentimes that requires um, a lot of work and engineering. And so I don't, I, you know, in terms of what we write into the zoning overlay, you know, I'm not going to write into, you know, we could make a generic reference to that. I'm not going to have any requirements because there's so many other requirements that have to happen for stormwater. And so, you know, I, we could have a nod to it, but I'm not going to say it has to meet a certain permit or standard because those could change and then the bylaws outdated. But, um, you know, we can talk about that at the housing subcommittee, I guess, if we want some kind of reference there. But there's okay. pretty, there's a lot yeah. of safeguards in place. Yes, we do have a capable conservation commission. Okay, um, Pam, I think we could move Janet back to the oh. attendees. Yes. And uh, okay, so we'll go on. The time is 9.34 and old business. Chris, anything that we did not anticipate? How about? No how old about business, business, no new business. Um, no, no new business. That I know of, no. All right, I, did, I think I did see some A&R subdivisions. Can we, we excuse Karen? It's 3.30 where she is. Oh, yeah. Karen, <laughs> you, you are certainly able able to depart if you'd like thank you and no news from the design review okay okay all right thank you okay we uh, do all right a and r's yeah pam do you want to explain these or um, I'm going to let you do the talking, Chris. I don't have much voice left at this point. Let me just see if I can find the um, the documents. That would be the best thing. All right. One of the ANRs, I'll just start talking and then Pam can find the documents. One of the ANRs is on a little street called Webster Street. And um, it really involves a, pro a property that is at the corner of Main Street and Webster Street. And it's a property that's for sale right now, mm -hmm. um, but as as uh, as they're thinking about what to do with the property, um, they are planning to carve off a little piece of the, I guess this is the southwest corner of the property, and um, sell it to this um, building that's marked 18 Webster Street. And so it's a little kind of a pork chop shaped um, or lollipop shaped property that is being carved off 39, 69 square feet. And it would be added to the um, property that is currently occupied by this dwelling unit, number 18. And there's no um, reason to think that this needs to go through the uh, subdivision uh, process. So what you were would be doing is saying that um, this is not, this does not be, uh, I can't talk anymore. This does <laughs> not require subdivision approval. It is mainly, it is purely an A&R approval not required. So um, you would authorize Doug Marshall to make the uh, endorsement on the plan that subdivision approval is not required. Uh, Janet. I might be just tired, but so this new this new lot with the building is it's gonna be conforming. It's we're not creating a non-conforming situation. It is non-conforming, but it's less non-conforming than it was previously. And I've asked the building commissioner if that's an issue to be concerned about, and he says he said no. Okay. Could could Pam just like take our little cursor and show me the original lot? Because I'm just a little lost. Yeah, it's labeled old lot line. That's oh, okay. the original so, lot. So it's that tiny thing. Okay, thank you. That's it. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Anybody object to my agreeing this is not require subdivision? I'm not seeing any hands. All right. Pam, why don't we go to the next mm -hmm. one? Okay, the next one is um, one that you're familiar with, uh, 45 and 55 South Pleasant Street. So you knew when you approved the site plan review um, for this process, this pro property um, and this project that Barry Roberts is building, 
um, it's the old Hastings building, and then it's the property that used to contain the little brown building, which was the Red Door Salon. So the idea here mm -hmm. is to um, combine those two lots. So there's one lot that can be developed with the um, project that you all approved a few couple months ago. Um, so this does not require subdivision approval, in my opinion. And so I'm asking you to um, confirm that you agree with that and that you authorize Doug Marshall to sign the plan. Any objections? Not seeing any hands. Okay, good. All right. Next item, uh, ZBA applications. Any upcoming mm -hmm. that we should know about? Um, I... I didn't get to that today. I started work right. at 7 a.m. and didn't get to it. So if Chris oh. and Nate want to um, highlight anything that we haven't already shared. Okay. All right. Can't think of anything. Not seeing anything from mm -hmm. them. Uh, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. Anything? Actually, go back to the ZBA. Did I tell you about the Black Walnut Inn? The Black uh, Walnut Inn in North Amherst? No. Um, it's changing hands, and so there are some uh, changes that need to occur. They need to submit a new um, site plan. That's for ZBA. And um, I think there may be a condition or two that needs to be changed. So that's something that is go going to come before the CBA. Now back to planning board for site plan review. We have the application for Barry Roberts' new project at the corner of Amity Street and University Drive. I have it in my office. Um, we haven't thoroughly scrutinized it yet. Um, and when we do, we'll set a public hearing date. And that would probably be at least in July. My guess is it would be towards the later part of July, if not later than that. Um, and I can't think of anything else, although we're constantly talking to developers and things are coming, coming mm -hmm. in the door, but okay. I don't think we have anything else solid. All right. Okay. Planning board committee and liaison reports, Bruce, anything on PVPC? Nothing to report. All right. Uh, for CPAC, I can tell you that, um, I think it's uh, council that has asked that CPAC reconsider or amend its approval of some money for the the track at the high school, uh, which at in the original approval was limited to an artificial turf uh, or you know an artificial surface, um, and um, not not for the track but for the field, and so we're being asked to consider releasing that requirement to allow a natural uh, turf field. And that we meet on that tomorrow if anybody wants to spend another night in front of Zoom. Um, so that's my report. Uh, we heard from DRB, uh, from Karen, she didn't mm -hmm. have anything. Um, Chris, anything on CRC? Yes, the CRC is still working on the um, solar bylaw. I think they're probably not going to get back to it. Well, when are they getting back to it? This coming um, Tuesday, I, I think. Okay. The 11th, I believe that's right. All right. Uh, all right, and then uh, report of chair. I don't really have anything to report. Chris, anything on staff other than that you're overloaded and you're tired? <laughs> um, nothing except that Jacinta and Nate put out two grant applications today working together. Nate had done a lot of the upfront work ahead of time, but I was pretty amazed to see them putting out two grant applications. And then Nate was able to present um, his zoning amendment tonight. So mm -hmm. Nate has worked overtime and more today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bruce, I see your hand. Yes, we, we seem to zoom over, I guess, would it be, I, I had a new business or unanticipated stuff. I had a, a question that uh, occurred to me as I was driving through town a couple of times today. And uh, it has to do with the Jersey barriers that are uh, basically uh, creating uh, the restaurant space for some of the restaurants around Antonio's and so forth. 
and I, I couldn't help noticing that the, uh, the similar uh, enclosures that uh, work for the, uh, uh, the the restaurant on just near Hastings and also Amherst Coffee around the corner where the, the enclosures are much nicer and, and uh, far, far, far more agreeable. I was The question is, were those Jersey barriers just put up uh, during COVID in, in a kind of a, uh, a perfunctory way uh, or did they come before this board and did we approve uh, all of that sort of stuff and the question if the answer is that we did then the question would be why what was the process that got us uh, the kind of enclosures between the uh, the the places on pleasant street and, and outside Amherst coffee versus the uh, the jersey barriers in front of um, antonio's chris so um, the Jersey barriers were um, a joint effort of the DPW and the building commissioner to demarcate places for outdoor dining. Um, when we did apply for a grant for those nicer installations, the one near Hastings and the one in front of Amherst Coffee, and um, we asked restaurants if they wanted those, and those two restaurants said yes. So they got them. Other restaurants were not um, inclined to have them. And there were also problems with, um, I think, slope of the street in some locations. So they wouldn't have worked in some locations. But the people who wanted them got them. And they are brought out by the DPW in the spring and put away in the fall. And as are the Jersey barriers. And the planning board did not um, approve any of that because it's all within the town right of way. So the planning board actually doesn't have jurisdiction over it. Um, I believe that the design review board might have reviewed the platforms, the nicer platforms, but I'm not sure about that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'll I'll see if I can phrase uh, some other questions more uh, useful uh, later on. You mean at a later meeting? I was thinking about midnight, but. Uh... <laughs> All right. Well, I'll make you the host in just a few minutes, Bruce. All right. So, uh, Chris, was did you have any report of staff? Just to thank Nate for his hard work today with those grant okay. applications. All right. All right. So the time uh, on my computer is 945. I think we are able to adjourn. Thank Sorry, you. just a quick. I'm going to make. I was gonna make a quick plug on uh, June 10th. There is a, um, a meeting to uh, look at the VFW site for uh, shelter and housing. And so it's um, an in-person meeting. We have the narrow gate architects are gonna be there helping facilitate and staff. And so there'll be uh, you know different opportunities for input on the design of the site, of the building, on services. And so it's a, you know, the town's hired narrow gate to have a, you know, a three or four month process to help get a conceptual idea and programming ideas for that VFW site. So on Monday, there'll be a, a meeting and there'll be some subsequent meetings, but this will be the first public meeting on this process. And it's in person in town hall. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you all. See you on the 26th. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Bye. Good night, Pam. Is you